Okay, so and I'd like to also thank the Survey Research Center for sponsoring this symposium as they do every year since its inception. And I'd like to thank IAPHS and ISEE for their support um, to get this, uh, this symposium brought live cast out across the country. And so the way we're gonna do things today is that we have um, four panel presentations talking about racialization in different sociopolitical settings. And we have a break between speakers two and three. And then we have a break after speaker four and we're gonna convene again for at 3.30 to 4.30 for a moderated discussion on measurement of racialization. And so with that, I thank you all and I thank the speakers for coming and I'd like to turn the podium over to the ISR director, Kate Cagney. Thank you, Maggie. Can you, can you hear me okay, both in the room and virtually? Great, thank you. So um, I am, as Maggie said, the director of the Institute for Social Research. I'm pleased you could join us today for the annual Racism Lab Symposium. Racism Lab is a Rackham interdisciplinary workshop that serves as a research collective of doctoral students, postdoctoral fellows, and junior faculty who study race and racism through a critical lens. The lab facilitates the career growth of its members by working through scientific questions, professional development, and weekly sessions to provide critical feedback and writing accountability. And I loved that notion. And I thought I could use a little writing accountability. <laughs> so I think that's a really great pursuit. Racism Lab hosted a series of writing retreats before the pandemic. And we're looking forward to these retreats resuming in the coming year. Today's annual symposium is the latest in a series that has hosted scholars from the humanities, social sciences, and health sciences from all over the US to discuss specific topics on the study of race and racism. This year, the theme is centered on the concept of racialization from a global perspective. And so let me provide a brief definition. Racialization is the process of identifying certain features of a social group, stigmatizing those features, and then developing policies and practices to surveil, control, exclude those with those features, generally to some sociopolitical end to maintain a social hierarchy. And so that kind of helps us set the stage in many of the presentations that we'll hear today will draw on this notion. So I, I wanna note that the symposium is taking place over two days. So today's session is being live streamed from ISR to an audience of scholars around the US and with over 400 people, right? <laughs> you noted that are joining us. We'll hear from four sociologists who are experts in different aspects of racialization. After each of the speakers presents their work, we'll take a short break and then convene, that's what as Maggie noted, moderate a discussion to talk about how we might go about measuring racialization in population-based studies. Measuring racialization rather than race may better inform the underlying drivers of inequities and the policies that can address them. And so I do wanna to note too that tomorrow's session is entirely virtual. Two racism lab students will convene expert panels to discuss different aspects of racial inequalities and how. <coughs> I just really also wanted to take a moment to thank Maggie for bringing us all together today. Um, we've been having a number of conversations about DEI efforts at ISR and Maggie's very action oriented. And I really thought clearly <laughs> today is a manifestation of that action. She founded Racism Lab along with um, doctoral student, uh, Courtney McClooney, who's at Cornell now, but I thought it would, um, in Maggie fashion, so, so generous to also note that your doctoral student was fundamental in thinking about how racism lab would, um, would take root. Um, but again, I'm, I'm thrilled with her activity here. Very proud on behalf of ISR to be hosting such an effort. And I wanna just close by saying that I'm looking forward to these next two days of scholarship and discussion. And, and now I'd like to welcome Leslie George Comey, who will introduce today's panelists and really sort of, again, um, help us in conversation later today. And so looking forward to learning from all of you. Thank you so much. All right, um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the first day of Racism Lab Symposium, uh, Racialization and Dynamic Global Racial Hierarchies. We thank you all for coming out on Zoom and in person uh, to attend this year's symposium. My name is Leslie George Comey. I am a second year doctoral student in the School of Kinesiology and a part of the Racism Lab course. And I am thrilled to introduce our keynote speakers for today. The name of the symposium is especially fitting considering the global research of our incredible panelists. Uh, so please give Dr. Jean Beeman, Dr. Sahar Salad, Dr. Kazuko Suzuki, uh, Dr. Melissa Weiner, a quick round of applause to thank them for coming out today. 
Uh, Dr. Jean Beeman is an associate professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and is currently a fellow at the Center for Advanced Study of Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. She received her PhD in sociology from Northwestern University and was previously faculty at Purdue University. She also held visiting fellowships at Duke University, the, university, the European University Institute in Florence, Italy, and the University of Notre Dame. Her research focuses on race, ethnicity, racism, international migration, and, and state violence in both France and the United States. During her current fellowship at Stanford, Dr. Beeman has been working with a book manuscript tended to be titled Suspect Citizenship, an ethnographic examination of anti-racist mobilization and activism against police violence towards ethno-racial minorities in France. She considers, she considers the ways that the specter of state violence renders certain populations forever marginal or suspect and therefore incapable of ever being included in mainstream society. She further demonstrates the limitations of full societal inclusion for France's non-white residents and how French republicanism continues to mark rather than erase racial and ethnic distinctions. Secondly, she will work on another book manuscript providing a critical perspective on racism and colorblindness in a global context. Dr. Beeman is well known for her previous book titled Citizen Outsider, Children of North African Immigrants in France, and she has published numerous research articles and book chapters. She also holds affiliations with the Center for Public for Black Studies Research, Political Science, Feminist Studies, and Global Studies at UC Santa Barbara. Dr. Sahar Salad is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at Simmons University. She earned her PhD from Loyola University, Chicago, and Dr. Salad's research centers on racialized surveillance of Muslims, and she studies racialization, Islamophobia, and citizenship among Muslim populations across the globe. Her book, Forever Suspect, Racialized Surveillance of Muslim Americans in the War on Terror, examines how Muslim men and Muslim women experience gendered forms of racialization through the rapid increase of hyper surveillance during the war on terror. She is currently writing a book called Islamophobia, 21st Century Racism, where she and others examine how the global war on terror has justified the detention, imprisonment, and hyper surveillance of Muslims across the globe, specifically in the United States, the UK, India, and China. Dr. Salad is also working on a second project that looks at surveillance, policing, and political participation of Black immigrants and African-American Muslims in the United States. Now, Dr. Kazuko Suzuki is an associate professor at so of sociology at Texas A&M University. She earned her PhD in sociology from Princeton. Prior to arriving at Texas A&M, Dr. Suzuki was a visiting professor and research fellow at several institutions including Yale University's Program of Ethnicity, Race, and Migrations, Stanford University Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and Princeton University's School of Social Science. Dr. Suzuki specializes in, in international migration, race, and ethnic relations, both in the US and internationally, gender and sexuality, and East Asian, specifically Japanese studies. Her research interests include modes of incorporation and immigrant ad adaptation from an international comparative perspective, historical and re regional analysis of race beyond the Western paradigm, as well as global diffusion of race and racisms. In another line of research, she also examines gender and sexuality in Japanese popular culture media. Dr. Suzuki is the author of the award-winning book, Divided Fates, the State, Race, and Korean Immigrants Adaption in Japan and the United States, which compares adaption patterns of three Korean diasporic groups in Japan and the United States. Now, another fun fact, Dr. Suzuki will also be a guest lecturer here at UMich this Thursday for the lecture series at the Center for Japanese Studies on April 6th from 12 to 1.30 p.m. It'll be in Weiser Hall, room 1010, so show up to that if you can. Um, and last but not least, we have Dr. Melissa Weiner, She's an associate professor of sociology and anthropology at the College of Holy Cross. She received her PhD in sociology from the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. She's been affiliated with the 
European Research Center of Migration and Ethnic Relations at Utrecht University, and the National Institute for the Study of Dutch Slavery and its Legacy in Amsterdam. Dr. Weiner's research interests and areas of expertise encompass concepts surrounding race and ethnicity, education, social movements, Europe, colonialism, and slavery. Her work, rooted in critical race and decolonial scholarship, identifies and theorizes white supremacist mechanisms of racism and colonialism in the United States and internationally. She has authored several books, including Smash the Pillars, Decoloniality and the Imaginary of Color in the Dutch Kingdom, and numerous research articles, such as Towards a Critical Global Race Theory. Among her many academic roles, Dr. Weiner has also founded and runs an NGO called a Brighter World Books, which is dedicated to working with low-income African schools in South Africa to fill their libraries with the books that they need. Now, that wasn't helpful, but these, please give these incredible panelists another round of applause. Okay, hello, thank you everyone for being here. Um, folks here actually materially, as well as all the folks um, virtually. Thank you so much to the Racism Lab at the Institute of Social Research, especially to Maggie and Amanda for all the amazing work that you did getting us here. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel with scholars doing this really important and truly cutting edge and field advancing work around theorizing racialization nationally and internationally, even as it continues to remain largely in the margin, margins of the discipline and of course attacked by politicians and the public nationally. Today, I'll discuss um, a little bit about how I would update the piece that I believe that you've all read. I wrote that a little bit over, well, yeah, over 10 years ago now. And given my own shifts in thinking and shifts in the field, um, I'm, I was really, I'm really excited about this opportunity to re-engage some of this theory and think about ways that we can continue to advance our scholarship around racialization. Um, OK, let's see. All right, so in the fall of 2011, I was in Amsterdam to complete field work addressing racialization in a public primary school classroom and elementary history school textbooks. Over and over, I was repeatedly told by colleagues in the sociology department that race and racism doesn't exist here. So in classes about stratification, where in the United States, it would usually be like race, class, gender. Um, it was class and gender and like race was just not talked about. Um, it was really quite stunning to hear this over and over. Um, especially in a country where, as you'll see in Dr. Beeman's presentation, this is a country that centers its Christmas presentation, its Christmas festivities around a blackface minstrel character. So it just was mind boggling. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm in a, this position as an untenured faculty member, as a guest at these institutions, you know, how do I really respond to this? And so this article was really my response to it. Like we can actually measure whether or not race and racism exist by studying it as sociologists. Um, and so, so this was the piece. Um, and so the piece um, defined, very hopefully, clearly, race, and et race versus ethnicity and that difference, because in the Netherlands, there was just a ton of slippage. Like, people would use the word ethnicity, but they wouldn't use race. And so, of course, we know that race involves power dynamics. Ethnicity doesn't. Um, and so really like separating those out and making sure that folks are clear on, on those differences. Um, what is racialization? What is racism? As well as links to nationalism, which I think is really important in, in the European context and the metropole, thinking a way that nationalism um, shapes colorblindness, whiteness, citizenship, et cetera. And then I laid out um, 10 empirics of racialization that um, with many, many um, ways of addressing this, relying on the literature doing this from basically all over the world. Um, so these aspects of racialization, as well as um, looking to anti-racist efforts, because if there's no racism, then there would not be anti-racist efforts. Um, and so thinking about how we can use our um, sociological tools to address this in places that might be resistant to acknowledging the role of race um, and especially whiteness. Uh, <clears throat> since then, let's see, yeah, since then, um, We've seen exciting new developments within sociology and across disciplines. We've seen scholars centering Du Boisian sociology, building on the work of Earl Wright III and Alden Morris, richly historicizing work on uh, historically marginalized and exploited communities, 
to speak from their perspectives on not only how they experience these phenomena, but also develop more holistic understandings of contemporary white supremacist mechanisms maintaining economic inequality in a capitalist economy alongside and also centering black life ways, experiences, and understandings of the world. Relatedly, we've seen the resurgence of black feminist sociology building from Patricia Hill Collins, Rose Brewer, Joyce Ladner's foundational work. Um, just to note, um, I did these slides and sent them in a couple days ago. And of course, in the two days that we've had, I've already thought of people that I've missed. So deeply, deeply apologize if I'm missing folks on these slides. Um, these were some of the folks that I was thinking about like Saturday morning um, as I was putting this all together. So again, come, apologies to those that um, I've missed. Um, and also there's plenty of other articles that do this as well that feature into these larger cosmology, cosmologies of understanding the ways of the world. And so these are really just um, like some good books that I, I like and would highly recommend in a lot of ways. Um, with regard to the role of coloniality and empire, we've also seen a resurgence of scholarship building on earlier work, such as that of Zine Magubane and Lee Maracle, that center the ways in which colonial relationships continue to impact local, national, and international relationships, lived experiences, and structural inequities. Importantly here is the role of indigenous scholars and in work on indigeneity that considers these impacts outside Eurocentric capitalism and colonialism, and thinks beyond colonialism, borders, and relationships with human and non-human kin, and a feminist perspective that considers gender relations, including with Mother Earth, outside of settler imposed patriarchal relationships. Of critical import here too are sociologists working in and with community to consider the ways in which coloniality continues to impact local communities and indigenous resistance to ongoing erasure, genocide, and forced displacement. Alongside, of course, working within the discipline through, for example, the new indigenous peoples and native na nations section of ASA. We've also seen exciting new work deparochializing scholarship by decentering the United States in sociology using cross disciplinary and cross national comparisons, making critical sociological links across territories, time, and space within a global colonized world to consider the interrelationship between US particulars and global phenomena. Considering these together and on their own as theoretical cases outside the global north allow us to better sociologically understand gender, kinship, family, patriarchy, financial systems, debt and wealth, property, criminalization, whiteness, capitalism, violence, exploitation, land, community, sovereignty, displacement, borders, agency, liberation, freedom, et cetera, all the things that many of us are interested in. And then finally, we've seen some really exciting new forms in sociology. Um, these books engaging the social world, but written for pub more public audiences with personal perspectives, especially in including E. Ewing's poetry and electric arches. These works drawing on multiple interdisciplinary forms while still deeply rooted in sociological thinking, envisioning and offering possibilities for not only new sociological forms, but new ways of being in the world in relation and in community with each other, oftentimes um, either explicitly or um, implicitly thinking about moving beyond um, our contemporary racial capitalist colonial um, social structure that we have right now. Um, and then finally, I've been reading a lot um, cross-disciplinarily, um, that's a word. Um, I've always kind of considered myself an interdisciplinary scholar and there's been really exciting work coming out in the last 10 or so years. This really important work of black indigenous and decolonial scholars past and present offers rich theorization and historical contextualization for sociologists interested in racialization. Considering these together, given that according to Tiffany Lathabo King, blackness mediates the relations of conquest in the Western hemisphere, is essential to identify the foundational interconnections between enslaving on the one hand and settler colonialism on the other that continue to have impacts on racism and racialization today. Um, we also need to consider the way that these groups conceptualize liberation outside of historical systems with their present manifestations. And of course, just to note that many of these folks, if not all of these folks, are building in one way or another on um, work by Franz Fanon, Edward Said, Amé Césaire, Cedric Robinson, and of course, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, <clears throat> This important work attends to the rich histories of these communities, identifying minutia of social life, interactions, transactions, relationships, as well as settler colonialism and racial capital capitalism, highlighting their centrality to the rise of modernity, disciplines, and contemporary racial inequality, all of which were rooted in extractive technologies that by definition are imbricated with oppression, genocide, and of course, resistance to them. 
Um, these works reveal the myriad ways that Black, Indigenous, and other colonized people have resisted these phenomena and sought, fought for, and created spaces of freedom in their daily lives for themselves and their communities. And I think thinking about the way that these folks consider freedom is also a way to kind of like flip it and see the reverse, which is the way that colonialism has um, impacted them. Indigenous scholars, for example, document how their sovereign nations have resisted both settler colonialism and capitalism by maintaining ties to their natural world, related daily life and social practices, and scholars from South America and the Caribbean who have been confronting anti-Blackness, enslaving colonialism, neo-colonialism, and imperialism for centuries with different racisms given the different historical dynamics, they have similar consequences for Afro-descended peoples um, to offer us important theoretical understandings of how these phenomena can help us more deeply conceptualize racialization. Um, and so drawing on this work, in these literatures, my own work has shifted similarly with two historical sociological projects addressing quotidian mechanisms of white supremacy in the US and cross nationally. One of these examines enslaving in the former New, ne New Netherlands, now New York and New Jersey, to consider how whites maintain black people in coerced labor relationships to their former enslavers during the quote emancipation period between 1804 and 1870. Another project examines the role of the US and especially US Jews contributions to Palestine's colonization. And so in, think, in the midst of thinking and writing on these topics guided by these literatures, this conference or the symposium panel offers really kind of an ideal opportunity for me to return to and reconsider the earlier empirical model that I had laid out. So in particular, I know that there's just a ton on this slide, I'm so sorry. Um, I'd like to reconsider the centrality of a necessity of engaging more deeply with the global impact of coloniality. This is particularly the case given the way that the majority of the world, as you'll also see in Dr. Beeman's slides later, has experienced colonization in some form. Important here is first attention to the ways in which if we understand critical race theory to mean that racism is built into the laws and the foundational structures, and given that settler colonialism imposes a structure and is not a one-time event, this means that the majority of existing laws around the world in both currently and former colonizing and colonized nations have laws rooted in colonialism that we really need to be considering. Related to this, since it was the colonizers who developed the slave laws applied to, in bo to both in these spaces, this also means that settler colonial foundations of our juridical structures and similarly implicated in the dehumanization, fungibility, and denial of humanity to both black and indigenous people. So as sociologists examining racialization, we must consider the ways in which the global coloniality of power and all subsequent structures imposed 500 years ago lingers, has shifted, been restructured, et cetera, including through contemporary liberal West and state-based rights models that reaffirm colonial relationships and structures and in many ways limit attempts um, and efforts towards decolonization. Um, and so these are just some of like the main theoretical <coughs> ideas here. Um, again, I know there's an awful lot on this slide. I'm really sorry about that. Um, and then we can think about measuring this. This is really just kind of like my brainstorming, thinking about how we do this, like at the very basis is the nation still um, a colony or colonizing? I think that that's something really important that we have to consider. How are existing laws rooted in colonialism? How are they rooted in colonialism? How do we see normalization of physical violence, especially against women and children? Um, how do we continue to see land theft and the lack of indigenous sovereignty? And again, some examples under each. How do we continue to see indigenous erasure of physical of uh, the physical and historical presence of indigenous folks? Um, contemporary relationships to the former colony slash colonizer, depending on if we're thinking about the metropole or not. So thinking about the Netherlands, they have a clearly very, I mean, if you look at their constitutions, a clearly very extractive relationship to their former colonies. Um, and then thinking about the way those colonies then are being extracted by their current slash former, like the Dutch colonial situation is a little blurry, but then also thinking about where folks fall in um, the global world system, um, a little bit beyond like, um, like center and periphery, but thinking about colonized versus colonizer and then how those folks are all related to each other. What kind of um, solidarities are folks building within, within and across each other, both in the metropoles, but then in also the um, former colonized, uh, current or former colonized spaces. And then just kind of thinking about um, also measuring racialized capital, uh, capitalist extraction, continued attention to juridical structures rooted in enslaving, how, thinking about how we can measure maybe fungibility, um, 
and just some examples here, as well as how we um, might measure white supremacist resource and profit extraction. And again, really just kind, kind of some suggestions about more deeply um, rooting our work on racialization within some of these larger um, contemporary and historical structures. And so then thinking about where we go from here, I think that um, as I noted earlier, there's all this really exciting work that we can all be drawing on coming out of sociology, especially with the current and newest cohorts of grad students and scholars entering the professoriate, many of whom are engaging interdisciplinarily to attend to these historic phenomena and their contemporary legacies using methodologies and practices rooted in care and community. Following them and their work should be a top priority for scholars interested in contextualizing, theorizing, and researching racialization across the globe. These suggestions include both methodological and theoretical ways that we can better accomplish this, both in our specific scholarship, alongside the ways in which the discipline can better contend with our own historic and potentially um, contemporary complicity with some of the phenomena I've discussed today. So thinking about um, how we might decenter US scholarship in our journals, um, thinking about the way that um, we use citational practices to either include or exclude. There's been a lot of conversation among some of the groups that I've been a part of about scholarship that is about various historically oppressed and marginalized communities, but then does not cite any scholars from those oppressed and historically marginalized communities, which I think is really important. I think also consideration of um, one's own positionality and discerning research projects, like some people might not be the best people to do certain research. And I think being able to be um, really reflective on our own positionality and where, what spaces we should be inserting ourselves into is really important. Um, and then also really considering how we can material, con materially contribute to decolonization. There's also a lot of you know, discussion of de decolonial sociology right now. And I think making sure that we continue to link our theorization of the role of colonialism with actual material praxis as um, Tuck and Yang talk about where decolonization is land back and that's it. Like if we're not thinking about that, if we're not working in communities with folks, then um, we really, I think need to consider what we're actually doing. And then finally, just ongoing attention to the historic roots of race in the US colonialism, empire enslaving and how these shape the lives of all of us, especially white colonizers today. So thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to hearing the other presentations. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting uh, me to this keynote panel. Uh, as a scholar who works on racialization from explicitly comparative uh, cross-national comparative framework, as well as from a global and transnational lens, being a part of this panel uh, is very important opportunity for me. And so I greatly appreciate all the people who are involved in organizing this symposium. And I want to give special thanks to Maggie, who kindly invited me to uh, this special incredible opportunity. And also Amanda, who did a lot of administrative work for this. Okay. Um, uh, in American society, people often talk in terms of race, uh, but the term race is not as simple as it may sound. Uh, for, me, for many Americans who live in society uh, where people are divided along visible racial lines and classified into official giving, officially giving racial categories, uh, race often means apparent physical differences and then skin color. And a lot of American people, American are puzzled whenever I make comments such as uh, uh, Koreans has been uh, severely discriminated against in Japan in domains such as uh, education, employment, marriage, and so forth. The more I study uh, about American race and ethnic uh, relations, the more um, analogies I find in the social position of Koreans in Japan with that of African American. And then people wonder uh, how it can be that Koreans are discriminated against by the <laughs> Japanese, those who seem to belong to the same race. Uh, if Korean speaks uh, Korean speak perfect Japanese and even dress like the Japanese. Uh, this puzzle uh, about invisible racial differences between the Japanese and Korean in Japan is also encountered by Western uh, inter intellectuals who know uh, that race 
is a race is a social political construct that believes that non-Western countries simply replicated uh, Western conceptualization of race. By examining how Koreans are perceived differently in Japan and the US in terms of race, uh, I can offer an interesting intellectual opportunity to think of peculiarity uh, of racial ideology that each uh, state holds and how such peculiarity affect the social positioning and the collective identity formation for the same ethnic group in each country. Uh, due to the time constraint, I will more focus on Koreans in Japan in, uh, or Zainichi Korean uh, in today's presentation. Uh, so first, uh, let me briefly explain the situation of Koreans in Japan when I conducted my field work between 1998 uh, and 2005. Uh, Koreans in Japan called themselves and came to be called by the Japanese state and society Zainichi Korean. Uh, the little meaning of Zainichi uh, is staying in Japan temporarily. And uh, although they are old comers who have been in Japan for more than 70 years, they're still called temporary residents. And the Zainichi Koreans are legally differentiated from the newcomer Koreans in Japan uh, who are called Tainichi Koreans. Uh, due to uh, so specific historical context of the uh, mi uh, migration linked to Japanese colonialism. About 650,000 Koreans reside in Japan. Uh, slightly less than 40% of all registered foreigners in Japan are Koreans. They are already in the fourth uh, and the fifth generation. They are highly acculturated to Japanese society. They speak uh, the Japanese. Uh, they speak Japanese natively. Uh, they behave like the. They behave like Japanese. Uh, they are. They, they use Japanese name. Um, so it's very hard to make a distinction between Japanese and Korean immigrants. However, Koreans in Japan remain alien on a legal level. Uh, the naturalization rate has increased since, uh, in the since the 1990s, but there still exists pressure, great pressure against naturalization due to social sanctions, uh, sanctions within the Korean community who see such individual as traitors. So one can say that Koreans in Japan have formed a highly acculturated but structurally foreign community. Uh, speaking of the data, uh, I conducted frequent field work in Korean concentrated areas, uh, both in Japan and the US. My field work includes included in-depth interviews and informant interviews of, as well as participant observation. I also analyzed various kinds of documents uh, as secondary resources. So based on the analysis of the data, I conceptualize immigrant adaptation as an outcome of the mode of immigrant incorporation. And this model is built upon the US domestic comparative model uh, proposed by Paltis and Lambert, uh, immigration scholars, and then modified uh, the US, uh, the modified uh, it, the model for the use of cross-national comparative studies, which itself is uh, one of the main outcomes uh, of this book project. And the mode of incorporation explains how immigrants are received at the three different levels in a host country, the state, or a state, a societal, and the ethnic community level. And I propose that um, most relevant context of immigrant uh, receptions are defined by those factors uh, listed in the middle of this slide. The combination of these contextual factors at each level determine the, uh, the distinctive state modes of immigrant incorporation, and it's systematically linked uh, to difference in immigrant adaptation within particular historical context. Context. So therefore, um, deciphering the combination of the contextual factors and the impact to the uh, experience of Korean immigrant is a central agenda in this project. 
uh, again, since I don't have, uh, I have lim only limited time, I will focus on some aspects of the state level, the state level uh, analysis uh, in this uh, framework, in particular, relation, uh, uh, in particular, in relation to the puzzle that I presented in the beginning of my presentation, that is invisible race. So in American life, race is a basic and of official taxonomy of personal identification. To put it differently, uh, race is often uh, the, it, it is often race that in the US that differentiates, hierarchizes, uh, stigmatizes, and marginalizes minority. Uh, in this sense, Koreans with uh, Mongolian phenotypes are not actively welcomed by the American state whose mainstream is Anglo-Saxon white, despite their high educational background and professional skill. Uh, in other words, the American state conceptualizes its uh, member state membership uh, from a territorial perspective. Sorry, I skipped the <coughs> second one. Uh, however, the uh, nationality policy of the American state is not sick as uh, Japan, uh, which I'm going to talk later. Nationality is attributed, attributed at, at limited based on the uh, principle of Jews only. Uh, if the person was born in the US territory, he or she is an uh, American citizen. In other words, uh, American state conceptualize its state membership in a territorial perspective. If in terms of naturalization, it is a political choice uh, by individual, therefore naturalization applicants are allowed to maintain their original culture and uh, cultural pluralism if they satisfy certain conditions, such as a uh, length of residence, uh, knowledge of American history, and the ability to speak English. And this allows uh, US Koreans to structure their ethnic and national identity in a hierarchical manner by molding a hyphenated identity such as Korean American or Asian American. In other words, uh, American citizenship is a form of thin citizenship, which does not cause much tension between uh, one's ethnic culture and a political identity. Now, in contrast, uh, the Japanese state adopt, adopts what I term a bifurcation approach, uh, which make a strict distinction between <laughs> Japanese and non-Japanese uh, based on nationality. But the nationality for the Japanese people doesn't simply mean nationality. Uh, in Japanese, the concept of race ethnicity, nation are virtually indistinguishable and the formulation race equals, ethnicity equals, uh, the culture equals, and the nationality is essential to the Japanese conceptualization of what makes one Japanese. Uh, so the uh, first uh, lineage, which usually connotes race in Japan uh, and represent, uh, represented by Japanese blood. And another thing is a culture, uh, which is used synonymously uh, to ethnicity. And then nationality is interchangeably used with citizenship in Japan. And then basically the conflation, the principally the conflation of these three variables, one, two, three. So lineage, uh, culture, and nationality, these were variables determine the boundary of the Japanese, but empirically, uh, these variables do not carry an equal weight. Uh, in the, in the post-war period, after Japan lost its colonial territory, Japanese nationhood has been, uh, has been redefined along exclusively ethno-genealogical lines and a cultural uni uniformity, or monism, or you could say state uh, sponsorship of one culture became a key value of the Japanese nation state. The ascendancy of race as Japanese blood uh, over other phenomena, it's so evident uh, that the language adoption and a cultural uh, simulation do not qualify one as a perfect or first-class Japanese unless one has Japanese blood. And moreover, 
uh, the, the Japanese state uh, grant nationality according to the principle of use on Guinness and by parentage, uh, which tends to equate ethnocultural loyalty and that political allegiance uh, to the state. Uh, not only does this exclude considerably acculturated Dainichi Korean from, uh, from the national collectivity, but also it, uh, in a very strict sense, it doesn't allow Dainichi Korean to become perfectly Japanese even after naturalization. Uh, also, naturalization criteria are very st stringent for uh, the certain groups and for, uh, forces applicants toward significant acculturation. So, for instance, uh, in case of Zainichi Korean, if they have speeding uh, the ticket, traffic speed, uh, traffic speed ticket, then that is uh, enough reason to be declined for application to become Japanese because they are not good enough <laughs> to become Japanese. Uh, um, so, so Japanization, let's see, uh, let's see, what is, okay, so let's talk a little bit more. So such a racial ideology makes a nationality endorsed by Japanese blood uh, as important basic taxonomic template imposed on Japanese society. So the binary distinction in terms of nationality, uh, whether one has Japanese blood or not, uh, emerges as a criteria not only for uh, admission for residency in Japan, but also entitlement for a privilege. Privileges. Therefore, there is kind of institutional discriminations against Dainichi Koreans or are non Japanese, uh, officially justified by the Japanese state. In other words, Dainichi Koreans are racialized as an inferior group uh, in Japan by not having Japanese state, uh, Japanese blood. Race as blood is not visible as in the case of the United States. And this binary uh, logic not only has a significant influence on this uh, psychology of Japanese people and Zainichi Koreans, but also formulate their social identity. Uh, despite that antagonism with the Japanese government, uh, Dainichi Korean community share the same assumption that nationality and ethnicity or political allegiance and the social identity must be congruent. Uh, in, indeed, many of my interviews tended to believe that they had maintained North or South Korean nationality if they wanted to uh, remain ethnic Koreans in Japan. And therefore, Zainichi Koreans who have naturalized into Japanese frequently attempted to justify their act of naturalization by emphasizing that they are not ethnic uh, traders, which rarely happened when I was interviewing US Koreans uh, during my field work. Uh, at the same time, uh, cultural monism of the Japanese state delegitimizes and suppresses other culture uh, because of a uh, lot of pressure uh, to solo Japanization. And uh, under such a situation, not only minority cultures are uh, suppressed, but also Zainichi Koreans tend to hide their ethnic origin and are hindered in the cultivation of hyphenated identity, such as Korean Japanese, even after naturalization. Uh, it is said about 90% of, this, uh, this is a guess mate, but it is said that about 90% uh, of Dainichi Koreans hide their uh, ethnic origin in order to avoid discrimination in Japan, Japanese society, and then impersonate uh, being Japanese. And in fact, uh, the, to find out Dainichi, uh, to find out uh, Dainichi who are willing to answer my question, uh, this was one of the most difficult parts of my research if it was not the most. Um, okay, so uh, in short, we, um, the overall context of reception for the US Korean is neutral at the uh, state level, while the Danish Korean uh, it is uh, unfavorable, which resulted in a different, uh, pat a different patterns of collective identities, identity formation. Okay, here, uh, I would like to explain a bit more about the degree of Japanese <coughs> and the racial hierarchy at the state level in Japan. Uh, this pyramid 
uh, reflects only their positionality, uh, doesn't, uh, not the number of glyph. Uh, as I said, L stands uh, for the lineage, C stands for culture, and then N stands for the nationality. And so in terms of lineage, class sign indicates that a person has Japanese blood, and then minus sign indicates a blood of different ethnic group and uh, in a similar way. And so here, uh, someone who is three plus is uh, uh, regarded as so-called pure Japanese and uh, comes to the top of the hierarchy. Uh, it's not the white people in, the U U in Japan who comes to the top of the racial hierarchy, but the pure Japanese. And then uh, the bottom and the someone who is three minus comes to the bottom of this racial hierarchy. Also, I didn't include that, that uh, aliens here. Um, the, uh, so here, uh, for simplicity, I, uh, I am comparing three groups in Japan. Nikkeijin uh, are descendant of Japanese who uh, emigrated to Latin America when Japan was still poor. Uh, their descendants came back to Japan in the 1980s uh, when Japan uh, experienced unprecedented economic boom uh, and suffered from a serious way started. And if you compare these three groups, you may think that the two plus signs, uh, two plus sign status um, might give, uh, might give a naturalized Danish Korean a better position than those who have only one sign, uh, such as Nikkeijin. But as, a, as I explained uh, earlier, the most important variable of uh, defining Japanese-ness is <laughs> Japanese blood. Uh, therefore, <coughs> two sign, the two plus sign uh, does not in, guarantee a better uh, positionality in the Japanese racial hierarchy. And if this were in the US, the Chinese Koreans who have two plus signs are significantly acculturated, looking like, uh, looking phenotypically similar to the mainstream, uh, should have taken better positionality, but it doesn't work in that way in Japan. So uh, here is um, uh, an example of impersonation or avoidance strategy by Mr. M, second generation Zainichi Korean male, uh, when he worked for a Japanese company during uh, with which time he uh, when he was uh, when he hit his ethnic Korean origin. So let me read. When I worked for a company, a leader of the labor union became candidate for a municipal election. Uh, we went for absentee vote, voting. Uh, young people do not usually go to go to board on, on their day off. So the company took us to vote all together on a minibus during working hours. We all live in a Bartra's dorm. So everybody took for granted that all of us had the resident registry there, the same dorm and the voting lights. But I didn't have the voting uh, right to vote because I'm Korean. And of course, this uh, they didn't know. Uh, in such a situation, I secretly disappeared and went to the restroom and then I stayed there for a while. Uh, when I thought they might be finished, I came back. Some people, some, some asked me uh, where I was. I simply said I went to the restroom. I didn't want to explain why I didn't have the uh, right to vote. So I hid myself in the restroom. In this way, I avoided conflict with, uh, with my colleagues, but more unpleasant situation occurred before the election. Since I live in the Bartchard's dorm, each of us had a mailbox. I went to the mailbox, mail room. The mailboxes were lined up and the notice of the election uh, printed on a colored paper was sticking out of everybody's mailbox except for mine. It was so obvious. I thought, oh no. So this is a, like he was worried about the jeopardizing his social passing by this. Anyway, I think 
uh, I will skip this one and then move to conclusion. So uh, let me conclude. The comparison of Korean uh, diasporic groups in Japan and the US shows that racial and a cultural similarity between the dominant minority groups do not uh, necessarily guarantee, guarantee smooth social passing or integration into the host society, it's host country. Uh, while Koreans in Japan and the US are both uh, racialized by the mainstream, different conceptualization of race by the Japanese state and American state uh, in relation to nationhood resulted in a different formation of collective identities of Korean diasporic group. And then Zionist Koreans were racialized by not uh, having Japanese blood, while US Koreans are racialized by not being uh, white Caucasian. Uh, this comparison shows that uh, race can be fabricated by the state or the dominant group, even when the phenotype and the skin color uh, of the dominant minority groups are similar, which is exactly a phenomenon of racialization. Uh, so finally, the main objective, uh, objective of this panel is to lay a foundation for a constructive discussion toward uh, operationalization of the concept of racialization and the modeling uh, study, studies related to racialization across the globe, uh, including uh, potential measurement. So I'll, I would like to mention some challenges that we are facing in these tasks. First, by definition, uh, racialization is a process by which groups of people can be classified as races. Um, so how do we operationalize processes of racialization? This is a big challenge, especially for social scientists who use race uh, as discrete independent categories in their research, like especially quantitative uh, people who do quantitative research. We have to identify elements or components that go into the process of racialization, which ultimately appear as discrete categories such as white, black, Asian, and Latino, for example, in the United States. Um, so also we should be uh, mindful that global racial hierarchies are not static and it is important to avoid the assumption that white supremacy is one <coughs> form, uh, form of racism or that is a universal phenomena, which you have learned from this, uh, the case case of Japan. And second, uh, what do we mean by measurement of the concept? Um, to measure the impact of racialization is not the same as to measure racialization, racialization itself. And finally, which level of analysis is appropriate? Do we have to aim uh, for a complex set of model that incorporate analysis at all level, like micro, meso, macro levels? Uh, I hope to have a discussion on these issues in the second panel. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi, thank you so much for um, having me to the Racism Lab. A very special thank you to Maggie and to Amanda. Um, this is my second time here, and I can just say that the first time I was here, I was so impressed by the work that's being done here. So I've talked about the Racism Lab um, in the years since. So my name is um, Sahar Salad. I'm an associate professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at Simmons. Um, university. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I've done and um, pardon me because it's it's new. It's the first time I've actually presented on this, but work that's um, coming out very soon. So I'm going to start with this. It might seem a little strange. I don't know if anybody knows who this is, but this is Lillian um, Thurum and I met him recently at Simmons. It was a really exciting moment. And the reason it's exciting is because he was a World Cup footballer in France champion in the 98 and 2004 team. His son played actually for the French national team um, this year in the World Cup. And he's somebody who has written a lot about race actually. And this is his book that came out in 2022. I'm a huge sports fan. Um, What's not on this slide is what's on the back of the cover, 
which is a quote that says, people aren't born white, they become white. So as he's giving this talk at Simmons, he keeps using the word racialization. And I was just like, my head was kind of, you know, so, because as somebody who studies and has written about racialization, and I'll, I'll get to some of this in a little bit, it's been very difficult in a lot of my spaces to um, convince people that racialization might be the correct term to use to talk about my subject matter, which is Muslim, our Muslims. So I, I go up to him after the talk, and I could have really used Eugene in this moment, <laughs> because I was like, why are you using racialization? Why that term? And he's like, racialization? Why not? He couldn't speak English. So there was a, there was a, there was a little bit of a barrier there between him and I. But he just looked at me like, like I was silly. Like, why are you asking this question? And I said, you know, it's been, I had so many translate. It's been very difficult to get this term, particularly within sociology, um, to be widely accepted. So I'm gonna start with a few definitions and there clearly are more um, definitions out there of racialization. The one that um, I've been, you know, I looked to at first was Omi and Wanant who um, have written on racial formations. So it's interesting because they wrote about it in their first edition, they drop it in their second edition. I know this because I emailed them. Mm -hmm. I was like, why did you drop it? And then they added it back in their third edition revised edition, the concept of racialization. So in that, um, they define it as the extension of racial meaning to previously racially class unclassified relationship social practice for groups. And one of the things about this definition that I found was difficult for me is that it still seems very rooted in um, pigmentation, the biological, the phenotypical. So um, I've, I've been doing work, I have a book that I'll talk about in a little bit, but in that book, I add on sort of to the definition of racialization, because um, for me, you have to really think about how race in the United States has been so clearly tied to the biological, and I think it still is. So for this, I define racialization as the process by which bodies become racial in their lived realities, um, because of biological and or cultural traits as a result of the intersection and cooperation between ideologies, policies, laws, and social interactions, resulting in the denial of equal treatment in society. Um, I don't put hierarchies in here, and that's something that I think we could discuss later on. I think sometimes we get really fixated on hierarchies, which miss the nuances of the experiences of people. Um, because of all these different identities that can become racialized. And I should also say that I very much appreciate the definition that was um, provided at the beginning of this, um, this panel. Um, and then of course, I, I just wanna acknowledge like um, Melissa Weiner's work that really looks at the ways in which we can measure and look at racialization as they exist. So I needed to do this because I found that the scholarship when I was in graduate school, and I was saying Muslims are experiencing racism. I'm a Muslim American myself, and I knew that Muslims were experiencing racism. But within my discipline in canon, I was finding very little scholarship that helped me um, discuss this theoretically and even make the case to you know, my um, faculty and, and whatnot. So what I found was you know, a lot of the sociological scholarship on race was focused on the black and, black and white experiences, which it still is, and it should be focused on black and white experiences, that these are very important experiences to um, unpack, they're ongoing, they're rooted in um, histories of colonialism as, as we've been hearing about. Um, but also what it's meant is that race scholarship is often so narrowly focused on pigmentation and phenotypical attributes. So when I'm talking about Muslims in a religion that's become racialized, how can I talk about this when you know I can't de demonstrate that they're that the question became, are they experiencing racism? Because you're, you're not talking about them in terms of these phenotypical and um, pigmentation, these attributes. So I'm getting pushed into immigration scholarship um, because Muslims in the United States, although we look at the history of Islam in the United States that dates back to the system of slavery, um, but most people are understanding Muslims as being in the US as South Asian and Arabs, this is about immigration. When I go to the immigration scholarship, a lot of it is focused on assimilation. And so these are you know, notions of how can they fit into society, not what are the racialized social structures and barriers that are preventing them 
from access to society. So this is, you know, where my work and why racialization for me has been so important to the scholarship that I've produced so far. So I just want to highlight one um, um, one article that I think everybody should read. It's um, Bill Nabashi Treitler's Peace and Race, Ethnicity and Immigration, in which she writes, so the title is Social Agency and White Supremacy and Immigration Studies, um, where she looks at assimilation um, scholarship as embedded in, in, white, in upholding white supremacy. And she acknowledges that racialization is one of the ways in which we can talk about the immigrant experiences, um, particularly in the United States. Um, now, with that said, I think when we're looking at scholarship or experiences in the United States, I do think white supremacy is a helpful um, framework to examine their experiences. So this is, and I think you read this article, which is based off of this work. This is my book, Forever Suspect. And in it, I interviewed 48 South Asian and Arab Muslim Americans. The reason I... Um, interviewed Americans versus immigrants was because a lot of the scholarship that was coming out post 9-11 had been kind of looking at immigration. And I was interested in how are Americans who have citizenship experiencing racism in the United States. We know that like after 9-11, the USA Patriot Act was passed. The language around the Patriot Act is targeting non-citizens. Um, so I was curious, well, what about American citizens? I knew as American citizens, we were having our own experiences, but I was curious to understand, like, how do we see the impact of laws and policies after 9-11 on those who have the seemingly protection of citizenship? So in the book, I focus on surveillance, and um, I argue that racialized surveillance is not colorblind, it is actually racialized. And this is the hyper-monitoring and observation of bodies by relying on racial cues that include phenotype, but you also have to start bringing in other attributes like cultural attributes like religion, language, nationality, and, and this is not limited to these, but that we need to broaden our, our scope of understanding race. Um, so I divide the book up into these um, different sections. How does the state participate in the racialized surveillance of Muslim Americans? How do citizens participate in this racialized surveillance? And then consequently, Muslims start to participate in their own, uh, in their own surveillance through self-surveillance. So this is, you know, when you know you're being watched, you're gonna start uh, monitoring, changing your behavior um, because of that. And the other piece that I wanna add for me, when we're talking about racialization or race uh, or racism, it is impossible for me to think about this as it's, uh, that it's experienced universally. It is deeply gendered. Um, and there are other you know, um, identities that we should also be paying attention to. So it's very hard for me to look at this in that um, men and women are having um, similar experiences. So I'm not gonna go through all of this because I do kind of want to get to the, I want to get to the newer stuff and, and like sort of, you know, I'm very curious to hear what any, anybody's thoughts on, on the newer stuff as I'm, as I'm in revision phases right now and oh, the press my book in two weeks. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very appreciative of this moment. But um, one of the things, one of the chapters I have is called Flying While Muslim. And it's about racialized surveillance in airports. And so um, what I found in airports is that Muslim Americans have various experiences based on their gender because of the laws and policies put into place um, after 9-11. So I did focus on the United States in this work. And one of the things that I found was that TSA, for example, is a creation after 9-11. We, it was the first time we saw federalized airport security. When I talked to my students about this, they are shocked that I could go and walk through an airport without having to go through the layers of security that we go through today, right? Um, but, you know, one of the things that they don't know is that there are all of these policies that have been put into place to prevent another um, terrorist attack, that these um, policies and practices um, Simone Brown has talked about airport security and she calls it um, security, security theater in terms of black women's experiences in airports, I call it symbolic acts of security, that we have these practices in place that hyper surveil some bodies over others in the appearance that we're making the nation safer from another terrorist attack. So in my work, I show that Muslim men have told me that they're on a list 
And I, you know, when I was, I was interviewing them between 2009 and 2012, and they're like, yeah, I'm on some list, I'm on some list. And I'm like, okay, what list are you on? In 2009, let me tell you, it was, these lists were not known. You know, it wasn't until the ACLU started putting out um, reports, that, and that was, a few, you know, around that time, a few years later, about what was going on in airports. I was reading TSA documents to figure out what were these lists. They were talking about having four S's on their tickets, which indicated that they were on some list. Well, it's the selectee list. And it's a list that, because of the USA Patriot Act, put a lot of money into terrorist databases, and these terrorist databases are under a cloud of secrecy, and airports are pulling, you know, names from these lists and people were, you know, going to try to get their ticket. They were told you have to go speak to a TSA agent, you go to the TSA agent. Your name is similar to someone's who, name who's on a terrorist list. Not that it is. It's similar. Because when you have four S's, you can actually fly. It just marks you for hyper surveillance in an airport. Muslim men were telling me that this was happening to them, not Muslim women. Things might have changed. I found myself on this list when I was flying from London to the United States. Um, you know, things might have changed in the years. So, but between 2009, 2012, when I was interviewing people under the Obama administration, mind you, these are the kinds of practices that were happening to the Muslims that I was interviewing. So Muslim men were telling me they were on some list. They had four S's. They were checked at the, they had to get their ticket from a TSA agent. Then they were stopped at the security line. And then even at the gate, they may have been called up before they boarded a flight. It's three layers of security that Muslim men are experiencing. Muslim women did not say they were on a list, but Muslim women who wear the hijab, the headscarf, were stopped and searched every single time they went through, regardless if they made the metal, it was the metal detector before body scanner, but I'm doing interviews right now, even with body scanner, they're still stopped and searched. They have their headscarves searched and I have lots of examples of this um, in the book. The reason I call it small acts of security is because I have one example of a woman who, you know, kind of pushes back a little bit, like the, it's right after 9-11, now they have women who will do the searches of women and things like that. And the man, the TSA agent, who's a man, said, take off your, you need to take off your hijab. She said, I can't take it off. You know, I can't take it off for religious purposes. So he gets a woman to come up, a woman TSA agent to do it. And she tells her to just check under her head, her head, her scarf for, that's a symbolic act. You don't ask somebody, if you have like something that's going to act, you know, participate in an act of violence, please hand it over before you do it. So it's really symbolic acts of security that are happening to make some feel safer at the expense of others. So this is my new um, book. I'm shifting to look at the global. And I apologize because I think you had an old title. I have gone back and forth with, <laughs> with the press because I actually don't use Islamophobia in my scholarship. That's another conversation. We can talk about that if you want to. But I actually really rely on racialization in this book. So I am currently um, revising this book with my co-authors, Inash Islam, um, who's at St. Michael's in Vermont, and, and Steve Garner. Um, we, have, we are looking at how Muslims are racialized on a global scale. And to do this, we are examining the experiences of Muslims in the United States, the UK, China, and India. And we purposefully picked China and India to kind of um, piggyback on, on your last presentation uh, that not all of this is in, um, in service of white supremacy. That actually we can see racialization occurring that serves other purposes across the globe. And so we really wanna broaden our conversations about thinking about um, only thinking about European colonialism when we talk about global racialization. So here are key arguments. Racialization, the definition that I provided, we you know, rely on that. So it's a similar process of Muslims that operates on a global scale, on a global stage. The global war on terror resulted in copycat surveillance policies that rely on the racialization of Muslims. So this is really important because what we show is that it, it started in Europe and the United States and it's um, 
it's been instituted across the globe, but it serves different purposes in these different nation states. Um, global racialization and surveillance of Muslims is gendered. We should we we look at that in all those um, countries. And it really allows us to think beyond white supremacy as being the center of the ways in which we talk about racialization or race and this notion of the West versus the rest. You know, So these are um, concepts and, and ideas that we really wanna interrogate and bring some nuance into thinking about it. So gendered racialization, um, Muslim men are viewed as um, terrorists, right? So, there are a lot of people who have looked at the social construction and racialized construction of Muslims as a terrorist. And one I want to um, just kind of give you a quote from is Deepa Kumar, who also has written about Islamophobia and empire. It's really important to read her book work as well. Um, she has a, a new, hopefully, she has an article out, which I believe hopefully will be um, coming out as a, as a larger manuscript about terror craft is what she's calling it. So she says, terror craft is a process that consists of evolving state policies and ideologies. The security state is an essential actor in the creation of a racialized terrorist subject through practices of racial profiling. Terror craft incorporates state craft in the security practices that, in security practices that inform racialization. Racialization of Muslims for us really relies on securitization and the racialized securitization of Muslims. Um, its impact is much larger than just Muslims, though, but it is using the terrorists, the construct of the terrorists, to justify these security practices, racialized security practices that get erected in the name, in the name of um, national security. So Muslim men still we're seeing are um, associated or equated with um, this idea of the terrorists. And we show this in all these four countries and the ways in which it's done. Muslim women, it's, it's interesting because they occupy a very different location. On the one hand, they're a threat to culture or cultural attributes, and in fact, a threat to what it means to be a citizen in some of these places. Um, they're also viewed as in need of being saved uh -huh. as well. So after 9-11, we saw the ways in which women in Afghanistan were presented as in being, the, you know, we needed to save them from the Taliban. Now they can vote and they can wear nail polish and they can do all these kinds of things as if war brings these things to um, women, right? So in the US, we see this narrative Yet we also see the narrative of who's attacking Muslim women the minute there's another terrorist attack. And I have lots of examples of this in my study that women are being, um, that, that, that they were threatened by men in grocery stores and things like that immediately after 9-11 or any terrorist attack that happens. Um, so this is really important in terms of the new project. What we found was right after 9-11, the Security Council Resolution 1373 was put into place by the United Nations. And what this did was it calls on every UN, every country that's a part of the United Nations, which is pretty much every country, um, actually, to adjust their national laws so that they can um, participate in thwarting terrorism globally. So this, this actually required countries to put into place counterterrorism laws and policies within their, within their nation states. So it becomes the call for the globe to protect um, everyone from terrorist activity, right? So we start to see as a result of this, domestic laws and policies globally, um, putting into place these, these laws and policies. So I put this up because England and the United States are two of the examples in the book, but PREVENT, is, and Prevent was created in England. It was inspired by the Netherlands, protecting violent um, terrorism, so PVE. They create PREVENT. We prevent vulnerable people from being drawn into extremism. And then that influences countering violent extremism, which is what we have in the United States. All of these programs are um, put into place to target, to prevent radicalization. So it's the state going into communities and saying, how can we prevent 
um, and you can figure out who's being targeted in, in these, um, by these policies. Initially, it's actually Muslims, right? So Muslim populations are being targeted for you know, potentially becoming radicalized. So how can we um, stop them? It's through part them participating in surveillance of their own communities with the state, um, back with state backing or, or whatnot. CVE in the United States, Obama put this into place. He called it soft surveillance, a softer form of surveillance where he initially was targeting white nationalists and Muslim radicalization and was providing these grants from the government where Boston, the community center in Boston participated and they get a grant, weed out your radicals within your community. So it's really getting them to participate in this um, self-surveillance. I'm gonna to skip to this in the interest of time, but NSEERS is another program where we see Muslim men being, where they had to register in the United States. It's, it's expired or been terminated. So Muslim men are being you know, targeted as potential threats, as terrorists. Muslim women, on the other hand, are um, culturally, we're seeing them um, being viewed as, in, as being needed of saving. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this film, Submission um, by Theo Van Gogh and Ayan Hirsi Ali is one of the ones who's written it. Now, it's really interesting because when I first started at Simmons, this movie came to us at Simmons because we're a women-centered institution and the students were coming to me, can we, will you be on a panel about submission? We're gonna show this about how Muslim women are oppressed. Just, let me just explain, like this movie, like really um, sort of solidifies the notion that Muslim Islam is a, is a violent religion towards women, that women are oppressed, that Muslim men are abusers. It brings back all the Orientalist stereotypes that Said talks about in his work and, and whatnot. So we have this film and this notion, Ayan Kursi Ali, um, is somebody, if you look at the Islamophobia Network, if you Google that, she's considered an Islamophobic activist, actually. Yet, her credentials are that she was a senior fellow with the Future of Dem Diplomacy Project at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School from 2016 to 2019. And on the next slide, you see that she's a part of, she was just a part of a Women's Leadership and National Security um, conference or whatnot. So what might seem like fringe people who are perpetuating very Islamophobic or anti-Muslim sentiments are actually um, getting a lot of credibility in terms of their influence and of, of policy and stuff like that in the United States. So I just want to shift to talk about China as an example. So in China, what happened was after 9-11, and it was years after 9-11, China has always wanted to really engage in the global war on terror in China. Um, there's a history in China with Uyghurs and it's a history of separatism. Um, that, you know, it's a very long history, but what we saw on March 17, 2017, was that in, um, Xinjiang enacted the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region Regulation on de-extremification. And what this law and policy did was it literally criminalized any Islamic or Muslim behaviors by Uyghur Muslims. So these are only three of Article 9, the points in Article 9, but you can see, you know, so how um, being Muslim is um, criminalized. So, you know, wearing the headscarf, wearing the hijab, interfering with others from having communication exchanges, mixing with or living together with pers persons of other ethnicity. So in, you know, if they're marrying other Muslims, Uyghurs are marrying other Muslims, you know, that this can be a, considered a criminal activity. And as a result of that, we've seen these camps. We see over a million Uyghur Muslims have been detained and put into these camps. China is a very different um, story in this, like Sean Roberts and Darren Byler are calling the settler, a form of settler colonialism that we're seeing occur um, in China. Now, what we notice for women in China is that Uyghur women have been um, forced into marriages with Han um, Chinese. So there are all of these accounts of um, Uyghur, you know, it's in this effort to erase um, Muslims, a Uyghur Muslim marriage with Uyghur Muslim children being born. So we see um, the Chinese state um, instituting um, in 2014 was the incentive measures encouraging Uyghur Chinese intermarriages. So it's operating under a different, um, for different reasons, you know, than we would see in the United States. 
Um, but it is in, sense, in a sense, we need to think about the material or the capitalist <clears throat> motivations behind you know, why this is all occurring. So I'm gonna end, I didn't wanna um, end it on you know, those huge negative uh, sort of, there's a lot of resistance that's occurring in all of these countries, the United States, the UK, India. Um, I'm highlighting a group in Boston, the Muslim Justice League that has um, dedicated their time and very little resources to get um, the, government, the Boston Police Department to stop um, participating in surveillance and particularly CBE. Um, those kinds of things. So there is work being done to um, counter this. So the global racialization of Muslims, I think the epistemological contribution is racism is a global phenomenon. We need to rethink our racial frameworks that only, I don't want to say we should think about some that center colonialism and white supremacists or European centric <laughs> ideas, but not only, that we have to include the rest of the world in this. Um, move away from phenotypical only and biological understandings. They definitely play a role, but not everywhere. And identify the material and political motivations behind um, racialization. So thank you for that. I'm sorry, I think it went a little bit over, but I appreciate um, your time. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm used to call and response. I guess that's harder with a uh, hybrid audience. Um, so yeah, I thank you so much, Maggie, for the invite and for the opportunity to be in community again with you. Thank you, Amanda, for all the arrangements and everyone at the Racism Lab. So I'm really excited to be here. I have the unenviable position of going last and trying to follow those amazing presentations, but I'll do the best I can. Um, okay. Perfect. Um, so what I'm going to speak about, um, I'm going to speak about these topics of racism and anti-racism broadly in Europe, and then more specifically in France, which has been the locus of my empirical, empirical work for about 15 years. Um, and so I, mean, also, I also made, I think, the rookie mistake of having too many slides, so I'll try to self-edit um, as well. Um, so this is the sort of broad things that I hope to touch on um, in my very, very brief, super brief remarks. So I feel like we need to start um, in order to understand present racism and anti-racism, at least in the European context, if not globally, we need to start with the question of colonialism and its aftermath. So um, I'm just going to start, you know, there's, I could do a whole lecture, I have done a whole lecture on this, but with the sort of brief topic, um, a brief quotes from Frantz Fanon, which I think, who I think is instrumental in helping us understand not only colonialism and its aftermath, but also sort of what anti-Blackness actually means in, in a sort of ontological sense. And maybe I'll have some time to talk about that at the end. Um, so just some quick quotes from him. He, he very um, eloquently describes colonialism as a quote unquote mechanism of naked violence of the, um, um, as sort of the bringer of violence into the home and the mind, of the, of the, into the home and into the mind of the native, excuse me, and then also sort of the natural state, violence is the sort of natural state of colonial rule. And what I think is really um, instrumental, or what I think I think is really instrumental in these in these kinds of formulations, is you know really troubling this, um, for lack of a better word, break between the colonial and post-colonial, right? Which I'm hoping to kind of um, you know I'm going to graciously uh, dramatically oversimplify, but like. Not Nonetheless, want to emphasize uh, in my remarks. So, sort of, you know, and, and also thinking in that sense about the European colonial project as, you know, structuring our ideas about race and racialization around the globe. Um, and, you know, I, I take uh, Professor Hulot's point um, that we shouldn't center Europe, but, you know, in the context of thinking about uh, much of the world, um, you know, Europe and the colonial, Europe's European colonial project is really instrumental in understanding a lot of these dimensions. So, I think. So I just um, pulled a quick uh, map of Europe and its colonies to, among other things, clarify, um, this is usually useful for my students, that there are very few areas of our globe that have never been touched, if you will, to put it very diplomatically, uh, by you know, European empire, right? And I think that's, again, like something I think is helpful to keep in mind when we talk about these questions of racism and racialization globally, right? Um, not just in the context of France, which I'm going to get to, or Europe, which I'm going to get to in a second, but you know, thinking about this more expansively. And relatedly, I think a lot of times in the social sciences, 
excuse me, we tend to sort of privilege uh, nation state boundaries. And I understand sort of why we do that, but I think it's really helpful to always have this type of global dimension in mind that, you know, people, especially people who are subject to European colonialism have to have always thought beyond uh, across these seemingly natural borders. And hopefully I'll have a chance to talk about that as well. So, um, one of the things I do in a lot of my lectures is really trying to trouble even the question of what is France. And so, you know, France, I think, is one example of, you know, broader colonial continuities where, like, what we see as the nation or how it's represented, you can think of that, you know, idiotic show on Netflix, Emily in Paris, is different from what it actually is, right? And so it's, you know, there's, I, I, I came, and I can talk about this later, but I came to um, studying France through learning the French language and becoming fluent in the French language. And one of the sort of axioms that you learn um, in high school is that France is the country with the most time zones, but they don't tell you why. It's like, because it has, still has an expansive colonial empire. So that's you know, what you see in the, the right, uh, uh, the figure on the right, right? There's still, so even though France is understood as a nation state, it very much is an imperial state and has overseas departments and territories that, of which it relies on the labor from to this day. And so again, you know, these questions of, you know, the borders of a nation, I think have to always be troubled, even though France is ostensibly, um, you know, at the end of colonialism. And I think that's part of what I'm trying to uh, trouble here too. So just a few words about sort of specifically thinking about race and racism within the European context and how it's in conversation with, you know, some of what the other speakers said around uh, racism in different contexts or racism globally. So here I've been really influenced by the work of David Theo Goldberg's framework of racial Europeanization um, and thinking about the ways that race and racism are often framed as exceptional to, to Europe, right? And they sort of exist everywhere outside of, again, the sort of continental Europe, again, being, you know, troubling that, that sort of, uh, those sort of boundaries. Um, and so, and this is, you know, also present in France, just to give one anecdote. Um, there's a historian, Sue Peabody, who's at Washington State, and one of her first books was called There Are No Slaves in France. And part of the reason why she came to the title, um, it's a book about sort of um, slavery in pre-revolutionary France. And one of the ways she came to that title was that she would go to France, to sort of mainland France, if you will, and ask people about slavery. They'd be like, oh, no, no, that didn't happen here. That happened in the colonies. It's not part of France. And this, I think, you know, um, this anecdote is so, so common in thinking about both the sort of, you know, history of France and, and Europe more generally and present day realities in France, which is that people see these structures as outside of what actually happens or, you know, is in relation to what's actually happening within the country. So the fact that someone, you know, in France can say, well, slavery happened the colonies, it's not part of our history, I think directly speaks to this tension. It speaks to this racial Europeanization framework, which I find really useful. Um, and so in related to sort of thinking about or the ways that racism is framed as, you know, exceptional to Europe, it's often also seen as sort of, um, sort of related to phenomena of the past. So there's sort of a bracketing, if you will, around the Holocaust, which is not seen as sort of integral to European history writ large, right? But it's just sort of these like, you know, a handful of years that no one speaks about ever again that has no relevance to anything else and being glib for the second argument. Um, Another part of uh, racial Europeanization that I think is really useful is the way in which you know Muslims are constructed as an other category, which is also very much true uh, uh, in present, well, historically in present day France. Thinking about the ways that even when you know race in quotation marks is seen as a taboo category, Muslim is still allowed to stand in as this racial ethnic other. And you know David Thilgerberg writes really well about the ways in which. Europe has always been constructed as this quote unquote Christian nation, Christian sort of body, if you will, at which Muslims could never be a part of it, right? And so this is part of the sort of ongoing racialization that happens presently in Europe. And France is just one of many examples of that. Um, relatedly, he uses this uh, term of sort of Europe as a site of quote unquote political racelessness, which again, I think is really useful to understanding the nuances under which race is really seen as taboo or illegitimate within Europe. Again, out, you know, totally suppressing this colonial and empirical, um, imperial, imperial, imperial history. Um, I've been very influenced by Professor Weiner's article on global race theory, which I've talked and talked about and lectured about more times than I can remember. Um, so thank you again for that work. Um, and also just thinking about the ways that, you know, race is just continually constructed as taboo. And so, um, this goes back to sort of also what uh, Professor Weiner mentioned earlier, the ways that people say like that doesn't exist here when you ask actually ask people. I think it's really hard to 
overstate how uh, entrenched that belief is in continental Europe. It's very much part of how people still today understand or seek to understand or talk about race. It's something that, oh, keep doing this, something that like does it or cannot exist within continental Europe. It's completely irrelevant. And so that really, just in my own scholarship and, and the sort of field work that I do, that I'll hopefully get a chance to talk about, um, you know, is really part of the conversation of like how activists are constantly having to challenge the denial of even naming the word race. So I'll get to that in a second. So I'm also um, want to speak briefly about this um, burgeoning and exciting field for me of Black Europe and really that takes, among, among other things, seriously, the idea that the sort of presence of Black people on the continent is not at all a new phenomenon, uh, but rather thinking really intelligently about the ways that Black people have always been part of Europe um, in our construction of Europe. And it's, it's, you know, we can't sort of imagine Europe or describe Europe without that. And so I want to... Um, and so in this sense, I'm really influenced by the work of sociologist Stephen Small at UC Berkeley, who writes, uh, I'll just read the quote, um, Black Europe is not just Black people in Europe. It did not begin in the second half of the 20th century, when Europe actively recruited more Black people than ever before to fight and work and live here. It began with the invasion of Africa by Europeans. It continues with the kidnap, transportation, and enslavement of millions of Africans and with the encompassing grasp of colonialism and imperialism across Africa, the Americas, and elsewhere. So in other words, end quote. So in other words, I think it's, I find this, his work and this quote in particular really valuable for understanding the ongoing relationship and presence of Black people within the continent. That's not at all a sort of new phenomenon, but rather a way in which rather if we start from that vantage point that imagine that allows us to reimagine even what Europe is, which I think is really crucial work that needs to be done. Or that, you know, some people have sorry to do, I shouldn't say it like that. Okay. So relatedly, um, also uh, uh, referencing the work of Stephen Small, he writes really eloquently about how black people within Europe have a simulta simultaneous sort of ambiguous hyper visibility and an entrenched vulnerability, right? The ways in which they're simultaneously hyper visible as if like the only black person in the room kind of phenomenon and also sort of structurally um, and continually vulnerable within different European nation states. And um, I don't want to sort of oversimplify his argument, but one of the, the sort of points here is thinking about the ways that because of the European colonial project, both these things are happening simultaneously. And that sort of leads to, he argues, very, very limited understandings of the actual lives of black people on the continent. And relatedly, he um, refers to this as sort of, he also references the sort of black irrepressible resistance and resilience in the face of this hyper visibility and vulnerability. So even while we simultaneously have a very long standing history, um, you know, in, in continuity of marginalization of black people across the continent, we simultaneously have a long tradition of, you know, anti racism and resistance to these structures, um, which I'm, I'm going to talk about in a second. And just, um, on the right, on your right, is the image of Black Pete, which Professor Weiner uh, alluded to, um, sort of from the from the uh, the, the seeming uh, Santa Claus's servant or helper or whatever word is they're using now. Um, and then on the left is the image uh, is a photo of Danny Mendez, who was the Miss Italy in 1996, and the sort of controversy around a black person representing seemingly you know white uh, European nation at cost. So I want to talk a little bit um, in the time that remains around my current stuff on uh, anti-racism in France that I hope speaks to some of these things I've mentioned up, mentioned earlier. Um, specifically, I've been doing a lot of ethnographic work on anti-racism and police violence within the French context. And I should say also that I'm an ethnographer, so that's my that's my method of, of choice and sort of passion, I guess. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I think, um, and also is, this also goes back to Professor Weiner's article of thinking about sort of which populations or more, uh, one notion, one indicator of racialization is like which populations are more likely to be surveilled or controlled by the state. And we can absolutely see that in the case of France as well. If we think about uh, contemporary Maghreban origin or North African origin and black subjects or black, black colonial, close colonial subjects. One example of this is was the 2005 Banyu uprisings throughout many of um, suburban outskirts uh, throughout the country started in a, in a, um, in a Banyu uh, of Paris after the deaths of, after the police killing, the police deaths of Zayin Bonner who are pictured here. 
um, and then sort of various events that happened right after their deaths, but then led to uprisings throughout the country. And it's also a really good example of, you know, in thinking about the sort of um, media coverage of these events, the ways in which it was framed as like, these people are delinquents, these people are not, um, you know, part of French society, they're often framed as immigrants, even the ones that are even the ones that are uh, born and raised in France, and as a way of sort of avoiding or subverting an analysis or a conversation about the way that racism actually plays out in French society. So that was really not part of this discussion of the media coverage at all. And, and I say media coverage both within France and even internationally. I feel like there was a lot of problematic uh, US coverage, US media coverage of these events as well. So what I'm writing about, uh, the book I'm writing about now is tentatively entitled Suspect Citizenship, which is thinking about how the specter of police violence renders certain people incapable of ever being included into French society. And so in this sense, I'm, I'm very intentional in two things, well, hopefully more than two things, but just I'll just say two things. <laughs> One is um, using the term state violence versus police violence to think about you know, sort of the overall ways that the state is marginalizing and devaluing particular individuals versus thinking about specific police killings. And then also thinking about the specter of state violence versus um, sort of literal discrete incidents, not that the incidents themselves are not important, but rather that I'm, I'm really interested in this sort of, you know, how that creates an overall climate under which black and brown populations in France are, are receiving messages that they're, that they're capable of ever being included into into the polity, right? And so this image here is from a 2019 protest, um, a 2019 uh, protest for the death of Adama Traoré, um, who was a black man killed by the police in 2016. Um, and on the banner, I'm not sure how visible this is, but um, you can see different the, the names of other victims of state violence and the ages under which uh, by which they were killed when they were killed. Um, and then pourquoi means why? That's sorry, that's pedantic, but. Um, yeah, so just sort of thinking about the sort of broader context in which, you know, the idea of the fact of the state violence or the threat of state violence reminds people of their status within French society. And I think more, uh, moreover, reminds them that they'll never ever be included into French society. They're sort of incapable of being included into French society because of their ethno-racial assignment. And I should have mentioned this earlier, but this is particularly, I think, um, interesting in a context in which um, specifically in France, well, not just specifically, so in Europe, this, the broader context of race is taboo, but specifically in France, this idea of a Republican ideology, which makes it so that race is not even seen to exist and the sort of hyper attention to that. So the, the specter of state violence and particularly the ways that it's understood as a racialized phenomenon by some of these activists that I'll talk about shortly, belies those conclusions. Okay, so picture here, uh, left to right, is um, Romada Dieng, whose brother Lenin was killed by the police in 2007, uh, Amel Bentuzi in the middle, whose brother was killed by the police in 2012, and Asa Traoré, who I just mentioned, uh, whose brother Adama Traoré was killed by the police in 2016. And on her sign are different other, are other victims of state violence um, you know, in, in, in France, specifically. And so my current work is really um, spending a lot of time with activists like this, to kind of understand both how they make sense of the anti-racist struggle and the broader context of state violence in France and the sort of you know, work that it does. So part of this uh, project, part one of the sort of chapters of the book is thinking about how we might understand or you know, the utility of understanding how Black Lives Matter is resonant in other societies. And I wanna be like 100% clear that I'm not at all saying that Black Lives Matter started in the United States and then whatever elsewhere because everyone cares what we do, but rather to think about, you know, um, how activists themselves, like the folks in the previous photo, are making sense of what's happening here in the States and what, they are, what they're saying about it as it relates to their struggles. So that's really where I'm trying to come from with what I'm about to say uh, in the next couple of slides. So, you know, one of the things that was really interesting following the death of George Floyd was how you saw more and more protests, anti-racist protests, not just in France, but throughout Europe. And again, like that's, and I'll, I'll talk about this in a second, that's really in conversation with some ongoing anti-racist work that was already happening in Europe. But nonetheless, I think it's fruitful to think about the specificity of the kind of 2020 George Floyd moment. And so Asa Traoré, who was pictured in the, in the last slide says, um, in, in one interview, she says, quote, when George Floyd died, that's our brother. They, Boyd and Charway, her brother, died the same way. I recognize myself in Black Lives Matter. We are all Black Lives Matter. Our common issue is racial discrimination. Here is over there, it is the Blacks, the non, 
whites who are being killed, end quote. And so this image on the right is from a protest that she led in June, 2020. So that wasn't, the timing is coincidental in, in the sense that it happened to be right after Floyd's death. She had already planned the protest, but it sort of became bigger than I think she even thought it would be in light of the timing. So just to clear, so again, like this anti-racist work was already occurring and it sort of dovetailed with some of the stuff that was happening, um, you know, in the George Floyd moment, if you will. And sort of thinking about, you know, what is resonant about the death of George Floyd, what is resonant about the protest, what is resonant about Black Lives Matter in a different context or outside of the Europe, outside of the US, if you will. This time. Um, so, you know, I've argued this uh, elsewhere that I think when we think about, you know, what Black Lives Matter might mean, not just in France, but in Europe, I've come to a couple of themes that again, I think are always in conversation with what was already happening in the European, in continental Europe. So first is this question around sort of fighting the denial of racism and sort of, you know, the fighting to actually name racism. So this is very present in my work in France, how activists are not just saying that state violence exists, but they're saying it, it exists because it's a racialized phenomenon, right? And that, that in and of itself is, um, is a huge intervention. Um, you know, and, and then relatedly protesting police violence, also kind of, you know, reckoning or getting European states to reckon with their own uh, histories of slavery and colonialism. So what's really interesting in particular, I think, following the death of George Floyd and how that's been sort of taken up globally is you have, you know, the EU parliament declaring that Black Lives Matter, but it's not, you know, in Europe, it's just sort of in response to, it's like these are the African-Americans, right? And so, you know, part of what activists have been trying to do, especially since the 2020 move moment, is to say, well, hey, like we also have your own history of slavery and colonialism. It's not just a US phenomenon. So this is another way of thinking about the ways that, you know, racism is often framed as not, not only not relevant in Europe, but something that's only present in the US. So activists themselves would be like, no, that's great, but it also happens here. And so that's also, I think, what you see presently happening when you're getting, when you're seeing sort of, you know, toppling of statues throughout Europe, that's, that's what that work is. And then, you know, related to what I mentioned earlier with um, the Stephen Small uh, reference, the need to sort of affirm the presence of Black Europeans, which, um, you know, the idea that they're, again, not new, but part, a long part of continental Europe, and that those histories need to be, those stories need to be told, right? And that's, and then, then there's a way that those histories are continually actively suppressed and denied. And so in doing so, I think activists, anti-racist activists throughout Europe are constantly challenging this sort of, you know, quote unquote, European exceptionalism as it relates to race and racism, right? That again, like, you know, because of its very long history of slavery and colonial rule in much of, of, of the world is not the exception to the rule, it actually is more the rule. I mean, sort of flip a weird expression. Really close time. Um, okay, just in the last few minutes. Um, so just to say a little bit about my framework of suspect citizenship that's in, that's in my book that I'm writing this year. Essentially, I'm thinking about this as, you know, how to understand how suspicion or notions of suspicion are attached to certain populations by virtue of their ethno-racial assignment and, you know, um, how these individuals therefore mobilize against and resist these constructions, right? So it's not just a story of sort of repression, but obviously how, how people actively resist that repression. And that's, I think, activism against police violence is one way to see that, but not the only way to see that, but that's the one I'm focusing on. Um, and so in doing so, I'm really interested in the ways that citizenship and you know, building off the work of the scholars that sit here is automatically racialized and differential. And you know, um, the, that notion of sort of who is a suspect, and this is also very um, much um, present in, in notions of Islam, in discussions of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim racism in Europe, right? Who's seen as sort of being worthy of surveillance, right? And thinking about like the populations that are subject to that. I'm really interested in, in, this, in this kind of theorizing, which I can maybe say more about later, around sort of not just boundaries of inclusion and exclusion, but really boundaries of like belonging and non-belonging and how people are like continually produced as non-belonging and, and, and not being capable of ever belonging, right? So there's a sort of, um, you know, so I really like, for example, uh, Mahuma Dami's a notion of a permanent minority status and the way that like colonial modernity led to the making of permanent minorities. And that's sort of what we're seeing um, in, you know, not just in France, but globally. And also just sort of thinking that like kind of trying to push back on our notions of, you know, the possibilities for full societal inclusion and saying like, actually the structure of societies means that there'll always be people like the people I've discussed who are, are incapable of ever being included. Um, so it's a, it's a very sort of um, uh, uh, pessimistic Read, but nonetheless, I think it's really reflecting the reality of, of what of what much of Europe uh, is facing. 
Um, couple more slides, let me skip that. Um, so I think that this matters for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons I think it matters is that I think when we have these discussions around our, you know, these sort of notions of like, you know, France is inherently racist or France is inherently white supremacist, I think we need to understand like how that inheritance is, is secured. And I'm arguing uh, in this book that I'm writing that this is like suspect citizenship as one way that it is secure, that there are populations that are continually reminded, oh, sorry, <laughs> that I, um, that are that are incapable of ever being included, right? And like that, that's a sort of structural dimension um, that hasn't been talked about. And you know, this is very similar to, or an example, I, I think, of you know what Charles Mills refers to as a racial contract. And thinking about sort of how these um, distinctions between full and subordinate personhood are continually maintained. And then I want to very quickly mention. Um, the notion of anti-blackness as a sort of scaffold, scaffolding all of this and thinking about sort of the sort of um, anti-blackness referring to the sort of category of ontological non-being, right? So again, like this idea that sort of people are not even seen as fully human and how they have to think through that. Um, you know, uh, so maybe I'll skip, uh, yeah, I might skip some, I think I'll skip a couple slides at the end, okay. okay. So, you know, one example um, is a, um, July 2015, Charlie Hebdo massacre, which perhaps some of you remember. And you know, there are lots of images like the ones on the, on the right of the sort of Jersey Charlie uh, motto that became an international slogan. But you know, on the left, there was Ahmed Marbay who was also killed during these attacks. And he was a Muslim and Algerian origin police officer. And there was a similar kind of movement to have Jusfi Ahmed as a slogan, but it never took off. And sort of thinking about who's able to represent France even in these moments of quote unquote crisis, right? Um, and then relatedly, um, so that perhaps you remember the, again, from the uh, Syrian refugee, crisis, quote unquote, in 2015, the image of Alain Kurdri, who was um, found, a three-year-old boy who was found on the shore of Turkey trying to reach Greece with uh, perhaps maybe you haven't seen the image on the right from Charlie Hebdo, the, the editorial cartoon of saying, um, uh, the, tra the French translation is roughly like, uh, who would have Alain have grown up to be um, sort of an ass groper um, in, in Germany, basically, right? So like, again, thinking about these questions of like, who's even a capable or imagined to ever belong in European society? Um, okay, and then I'm gonna skip this, skip this, okay. And then finally, I think just the examples of, you know, various black Americans who've been killed by the police, um, I would say during my lifetime, but really also just during the time I've been working on this book, um, which I think is again, a question of, or an example of suspect citizenship, who's even able to uh, ever be seen as capable of being part of American society or US society, right? And so I think Professor Weiner, I think you mentioned um, Robert Combs' book, which I really love the framework of bodies out of place directly speak to this point of like, who's ever capable of ever being seen as in place. And I think her work and, and the example of black Americans killed by the police uh, speaks to that as well. So thank you. So I should read over time. Thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. So we have a lot to digest and you can see why these four speakers were, um, were put on a panel together. There's a lot to feed off of each other. So we're gonna take 20 minutes and um, come back together at 3.30 and we are gonna be talking specifically about measurement since we are in a building of measurement. <laughs> um, so I look forward to, then to seeing you all in about 20 minutes. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and get started. So thank you for continuing the day with us. Thank you, speakers, for continuing the day with us. And now, um, as a quantitative researcher, this is actually a very exciting part for me because I've read all of your work about how we can now apply what we're learning from you to our work. Um, as often many of us online and many of us in the room are, um, we look at inequities. And, um, and understand, especially in the US, how um, problematic our race categories are and, um, and don't always point to policy relevant interventions and don't always point to what race really means here and, and in other settings. And so we kind of wanted to have this interactive discussion um, about how we might go about applying the things that we've been learning from you to create measures um, that we could use to study inequity. So um, 
as I as I mentioned to all of you before, we had um, students. We had about a dozen students uh, reading your articles and submitting questions, and then we had questions of our own. And if you, if anybody in online has questions, you can submit it to the Q and A, and I can see it here. If anybody in the room has questions, um, we'd like you to go up to the mic, just because so that people online can hear you as well. But please feel free to. It's very casual. It's very casual. So I just kind of wanted to start um, with a really general, basic question. Um, if, if you know of any existing scales or measures that can capture racialization, or if you were charged with developing a measure in whatever context you determine, you know, what would that look like? What would, a, what would um, measures then look like? What would the data look like? So if we were, for example, trying to capture racialization of Muslims there, and we understand there are inequities, um, what would these measures look like? Um, so, you know, same for, this is for any, any next speakers. I can start. Yep. That's a great question. I don't know if there's a measure on racialization, but I'll start looking <laughs> after this because I think that is important to think about. But I think sometimes when um, it's the reason I brought up like categories, maybe thinking outside of cat categorizations is because some of those categorizations are reliant on specific measures that I think don't capture the experiences of racism. So, you know, we can think about interrace of marriage and all these other things that historically, um, or, you know, um, you know, mobility, financial mobility, economic mobility, these kinds of things. And, in the, and for my research in particular, um, you might have those things, but still be stopped and searched, you know, have your, the FBI might come to your place of work, your place of worship. Um, so you have to start thinking about other um, questions to ask that capture those experiences of racialization um, instead of relying on the historical measures that have been used to study race and racism. I do think some people are looking at like in terms of Muslims and health um, disparities. There were there was some stuff at least after, right after 9-11, right? Like pregnancy and stress and things like that. So um, I would start with different types of questions than we've historically seen. So are you then arguing for, uh, are you proposing then that we ask more questions about what your experience is rather than the, the study that I recall coming out of California that you might be talking about was Muslim sounding names. When you name your child, it, it, was this proxy of how um, how much you were linked to Islam, and that and then that would lead to poor youth outcomes. Yeah, um, and so that was though then a measure not of experience essentially, but so that's what I'm trying to get at. And so you're are you, would you then propose that we get at more experiences asking? Yeah, I mean, I think that's important to identify um, the ways in which race operates in people's lives, right? So, you know, stops and searches, you know, encounters with law enforcement or, you know, federal, local. These are really important questions that might capture experiences of racialization that your racial classification do not, especially for Arabs who are racially classified as white right now in the United States, for example. So I, I just start like that. Yeah. Um, so this is uh, related to uh, one of the questions uh, that I mentioned, or not question, but the challenges that I mentioned at the very end of my presentation. Uh, so I try to think as if like, I. I I did a little bit quantitative study, uh, but I can consider myself as a qualitative researcher. But uh, so the what if, you know, if I'm a quantitative scholar, what, what kind of measure or what kind of model I can use? And so one of the things that I'm thinking is that uh, you, the racialization, as all of us agree uh, in this panel, that it's a process. So when we talk about process, uh, we are basically the one of the uh, very important aspects of sudden racialization is this 
process, analyzing the process. In other words, the we try the racialization scholars try to look racialization as a dependent variable, less as an independent variable. So how that category came into in a specific context, whereas a quantitative scholar they use categories as dependent variable, uh, sorry, the independent variable. So that's one thing that uh, uh, if the quantitative scholar wants to work on the racialization, uh, what actually do they want to measure? Is that do they want to measure impact of racialization? Do they want to measure racialization itself? Because that is a dependent variable. But then if you, you are talking about major uh, in, to measure impact of racialization, you can still utilize the independent race, as it, race or similar categories as independent variable. So that's a, one thing that I think it, it's important to consider if you are a quantitative scholar. Uh, the difference between the measure impact, measuring impact of racialization, uh, measure racialization itself. So speaking of the measure, measure, uh, measuring racialization itself, I think we all, uh, I think all of us, uh, to large extent, uh, learned a lot from uh, Dr. Weiner's uh, indication indicator. And that can be used uh, in a global context. Uh, so th those are one, uh, one of the example. But then when it comes to measure impact of racialization, that's another thing. So like for instance, uh, how that the racialization process affected uh, the stress level of certain group of people who are racialized. Mm -hmm. I can think of, I, I guess the way it's simplistically that I'm thinking of it is because I study health. And so if we study racial inequities in health, but Muslim Americans are white um, most often, except for South Asians, which are then, you know, very, Asians is a very heterogeneous racial group. We capture, there's very poor here. here. Um, then if I want to study race and health, but I understand that race is dynamic and changing. That's what that I'm wondering if my categories are not capturing the surveillance, subjugation, marginalization, what can we do? But you're right that Dr. Weiner's paper looking at citizenship, looking at other aspects might be very helpful. Yeah, if I could just uh, jump into that, um, jump in on that and just kind of piggyback on some of these points. Um, yeah, I mean, I will say, you know, as an ethnographer, that kind of shapes how I think about questions of measurement uh, for various reasons. And I'm also really interested in kind of what exists outside of categories um, in terms of how people actually experience social life. And this becomes, I think, particularly interesting in the French context because there aren't these formal categories. So how do people, how are people interpolated as non-white and therefore as racialized minorities? I think sort of, you know, asking people, spending time with people is like, you know, the best way to get to those questions. Again, like I'm very biased as an ethnographer. Um, within France though, I also think there's been a lot of really important um, quantitative studies that have used these various proxy measures, such as, you know, um, having a traditional, you know, Muslim Saturday name in, in scenario quotes, or, you know, using geography as code for one's racial or ethno-racial assignment, which I think captures some of the disparity, but doesn't do the full, um, you know, doesn't capture all of it because it's not specifically, it's not just a racial uh, phenomenon. Thank you. Okay, so these next questions have to do with the blurring of the lines between different racialized identities. Um, so the first question is, racialization is conceptualized and practiced differently across countries within citizenship to specific countries sometimes being used as social capital. What measure do you propose could catch that intersectionality of the, race, uh, of the realities where one's racialized identity is conceptualized one way in one country, but in a different country, it may be conceptualized differently. I think we kind of heard a little bit about that from all of your presentations, um, you know, uh, but especially from Kuzikos about, you know, being, thinking that you are one way here 
um, but a different way in Japan. But the same thing as being Muslim in one country and then your experience in the US or being black in the US and being black in Europe. Um, what, so then what do measures look like? Because then clearly, you know, it's not, we wouldn't, we wouldn't take our American racial categories anywhere else. They're, they don't have their meaning at this point. Mm -hmm. But I just, I think that the student wanted to dig a little bit deeper about how to capture them, these blurring lines that didn't cross sociopolitical contexts. I, I guess I think those in kind of that it like questions about citizenship, nationality, these kinds of questions that I think tie to race and racialization that I don't think it asked, you know? So it's, uh, you know, it's the social aspects of citizenship and the, there's the legal aspects of citizenship. There are the, you know, um, you know, who is, you know, and, and your racial hierarchy you had, you know, even if you're Korean, Japanese, that you're still not viewed through. So I wonder if there's a question that could capture that, regardless of where you are in terms of um, national identity, um, citizenship, even patriotism, patriotism or nationalism, which are operating in different ways in all in the countries that we're looking at. You know, um, I mean, I think just a. Um, I think just to kind of jump in on that point, I mean, I think it's really interesting to think about like how racialized populations themselves experience their racialization across different societal contexts. So, for example, in my own work, it's really common for, you know, Maghreban people or Black people in France to feel like, oh, when I go to the UK and I say I'm French, they, people believe me. They just don't believe me in France, right? And I think that speaks to sort of the broader ways that these categories operate and do operate. So sometimes you can sort of think about these questions of racialization across societal contexts through the experiences of racialized populations when they move themselves across different societal contexts. So that's another sort of plug for ethnographic methods. <laughs> I think and it, another question that a student had asked is very similar, and we were alluding to this and definitely Cosco's presentation um, got into this about bloodlines, but then navigating this idea of multiracial um, or multi-ethnic or multicultural, and how does that work then when you're trying to measure or understand quantitatively what might that look like um, if we were trying to measure you know, the concept. I think that um, Jean, when you last spoke, when I heard you last speak, it was in Athens at the conference and you were talking about who is it that we are trying to surveil and control? And then that is the measure that we use. And I was wondering if maybe you could expand on that or speak more to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess um, my, you know, I, I want to just really highlight Professor Weiner's article as, as really being instrumental in my thinking on this, um, in terms of thinking about that being one of the lo loci, locus, locus, loci, just kidding, of, of racialization, right? Um, and like, you know, there's a sort of axiom of sort of like, you know, if you want to know who the black people are in any society, like ask the police, right? I mean, it's sort of glib, but also there's some, some accuracy there. So, yeah. So if we have questions, we have a question from the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah please, please, please. So uh, about those kind of intersections, there is that saying in the global scale. I think that in order to, uh, to make a model, one thing that you have to consider is at which one, which level that you are thinking of, the state level or more societal level. And it depends on that, the indicator that you can use or utilize that it may vary. So you have to look at, you know, especially which at which level you are particularly interested in uh, in making a model, in, in particular quantitative model. Um, and also another thing is that because uh, as everybody said that it's a, you know, there's so significantly different various kinds of experiences uh, and different variable. So one way, concrete way to look at uh, is to conduct before starting the, uh, making the model. I think it's important that actually we go to the field and do, for instance, life history do the life history, interviewing people, and then found denominator various part of work. And then one of the interesting, uh, I think what the, the, the lesson that I've learned from my modeling is that uh, look at the specific group and then and the, how their patterns of that 
situation diverses depending on the context of various climates. And then that's the point that uh, at you know the how they are experienced, although their appearance or their religion, ethnic origin, originally belongs to the same group, but then they experience diverse depending on their destination, for instance. So that's one way. Like so, the one concrete way I would suggest is that uh, look at the diaspora, pick up the diaspora, and then. Uh, do conduct uh, connect life history at each location and then look at the denominator. That's one way to think. I'm trying to think in a quantitative way. <laughs> That's one of the things that I would like to suggest. I think so. Um, what I, I heard a couple of things. One of them I heard, uh, definitely I heard it in, but in all of the talks though, is that it's important to understand what it is you're trying to capture, what what is going on, and so then because there's not then you just plug in this. It's to understand what it is you're trying to measure, what it is it, what what is your research question, and then move forward from there. But then um, what I hear you're saying, what I also heard you say, Kuzco, is that um, is that even if someone phenotypically has not changed, that you can then see them moving. A, see them or uh, similar groups moving in different contexts and see that the experiences are, are different. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's another like really understanding people's experiences. Um, so then since we were kind of talking about um, inequity and, and there is a few, there were a few things that might allude to this question. There's a, this is a question from one of our viewers online. Um, so how are, or how should we, measures of racialization differ from measures of structural racism? Then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but overall, like, just, just thinking through this. Yeah, so just take, the, take this. my response of yes. me thinking through this yes, on the spot, exactly. um, rather than having time. Um, I think that structural racism still, for my work, I'll just give an example. It's difficult to prove structural racism in the United States against Muslims if you're starting with the basic understanding that Muslims don't experience racism because they're, I'm looking at a religious identity. So racialization is different. Than structural racism actually it helps to explain structural racism it's a pathway for me to understand that a muslim identity is racialized because i never argue muslims are a race that doesn't that's not the argument that i would ever make um race is a social construct right but the religion racializes people in these ways in which they have these experiences so if you want to look at structural racism exists it, it, the way in which we talk about it misses a lot of people's experiences with racism because it relies on the categorizations that we understand or we, you know, we use um, both in scholarship and the Census Bureau and you know, quantitative measures and whatnot. So racialization allows for us to be more nuanced and more expansive in our understandings of who is experiencing racism by looking at other identities besides just biological phenotypical um, examples. So I think the measures are important. And I agree that like, you know, you have to know what you're looking to identify. So maybe, yeah, looking at policing, looking at securitization, looking at um, citizenship, all of these things, and looking at racial and ethnic identification, because in some spaces, it's going to matter, right? And in other spaces, like, in Japan or in China or in India, we have phenotypical similarities. That's not the um, that's not going to be a helpful factor in identifying racism or racialization. So, so um, maybe it depends on structure. How do you how you define structural racism? But then, uh, in general, generally speaking, into I think. This in this study of structural racism, it's very important to consider intersectionality. So the, it's not just about uh, it's not 
just about structural racism, but then the indicator has to incorporate, especially uh, the at least uh, three uh, like structural sexism and then structural classism. Uh, those are the important uh, things that they need to measure, especially at the state level. Maybe in the United States, if you're talking about the, uh, in the US, US is more, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the scholars in the US tend to focus on the societal level analysis. So you can apply that in a societal context. Uh, but then these three are very important. And then when it comes to racialization, uh, I think in addition to that, uh, basically the, the structural racism, racism centers on racism or race. Uh, but then when we, when we study racialization, I think we have to just keep adding the various thing. How, uh, what kind of things become institutionalized and the structure become structured? Uh, so I think it become it becomes more complex than the structural racism. Maybe you know you might have different opinion, but for instance, uh, in Japan, caste is very important and the former untouchables. I mean, you may think in the United States, uh, for instance, uh, someone like Chinese Korean can make alliance like Chinese people uh, who has a similar colonial history. But in fact, it's not occurring. The pan-ethnic alliance is not happening in Japan, whereas uh, Chinese Korean, because they are so essentialized, biologized and essentialized, they are quite against the uh, racism is uh, akin to uh, or kind of cooperating with uh, untouchable, former untouchable. So that is something, you know, if you keep using the US framework, uh, you cannot capture. So incorporate the caste system or colorism, the various kind of things should be, has to be added on. That's actually um, very related. I'm just gonna ask one more question. This is um, because we were actually just hitting on, and this question is actually from a racism lab alum, which is fine. It's from Ramel. So, um, and it's actually for Dr. Suzuki. So thank you so much. Uh, so I have a question for Dr. Suzuki that builds off of Dr. Beeman's area of work, um, which is um, where Ramel also had done her dissertation. So I know that in a, what she's saying, I know that in the French space, sometimes conversations about race and racism are discredited as being US centric or part of US scholarly hegemony. Um, and Amel says to correct her, she's <laughs> well. And, Very right. And so yeah. Amel wondered then if Dr. Suzuki ran into the same conversation while studying, you know, in a completely different area, this, you know, this discredit. Uh, discrediting the ideas of race um, in one of the studies in Japan? Um, I am using the term racialization because, well, in Japan, even scholars don't know what racialization is. They don't use the term racialization. Uh, sometimes even lay scholars do not use this racialization in Japanese. And uh, the part of the reason is uh, we don't see race. Race is not so salient in Japanese society. Uh, I don't say Japan is a monolithic uh, country. There is some diversity, but then a lot of population compared to other part of the world, other countries, uh, still, you know, the diversity is working. So a lot of Japanese, including scholars, tend to see that uh, race is not so important. When we talk about racism, it's more about something more. What is happening is uh, in the United States or in other parts of the world. Uh, one major thing about racism in Japan recently is the, well, the consistently is Black people, regardless of nationality. Black people tend to be uh, uh, aggregated into one category, Blackness. 
So that's a you know the like France, Japan do not have the racial classification mm -hmm. or ethnic classification mm -hmm. in census, mm -hmm. Japanese census. But it, we use classification by nationality, where you came from. And then interestingly, the that's the measure that is used by at the national level, like at the state level. But when it comes to the societal level, the blackness are very much aggregated. It doesn't matter where you, which country you came from, but then your skin is dark, and then you show some, but in Japanese conception, what is considered to be black, then even Mexican people can be classified as black. I have some students uh, from Texas A&M, Chicago, and then went to Japan, was studying abroad, and they were shocked that they are classified into black at the societal level, and they were shocked. Um, if I could just piggyback on that. Um, so I, th I think it's really important to keep in mind how the sort of well, a couple things as it kind of just relates to the question and hi, Mel, by the way, um, <laughs> um, is, you know, the ways in which, you know, most societies actually don't measure racial categories. So the U.S. is actually an exception to a general global rule. But at the same time, I think speaking to Mel's question, that allows for an active sort of suppression of this kind of scholarship within these different societies. So I think we can sort of divorce the two the sort of lack of state recognition of racial categories or race as a legitimate entity, whatever that means, and the sort of lack of scholarship or sort of space for scholarship and research on these questions. Like those kind of mutually reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I want to, we do have a few more questions online and then of course of the students, but I definitely wanted to leave room in case anybody, if anybody in the room would like to ask questions, just please just, it's very casual. You can just go up to the, yeah. Okay, so I'll get things started for the room audience. Um, so I want to <laughs> thank all the speakers too for your amazing presentations. Um, I really love the synergy between your presentations as well too, and the, um, the overlapping um, themes and trends. Um, so across all of your presentations too, there's definitely a uh, a note of the systemic factors that are playing a role here. And I really appreciate this approach of racialization because racialization points us directly towards those systemic factors to look at how these dynamics are taking place. As opposed to in the US, when we mostly talk about racism, we think about a more of an interpersonal dynamic. There's some bad actors, bad apples, and maybe we can eradicate or fix those bad apples without seeing how the entire structure is playing a role here and oftentimes operating underneath the radar and outside of our conscious awareness. Um, so I just wanted to thank you. That's a long way of saying thank you for your presentations. So my question is, um, the other aspect, so getting to my question, I loved how your research touched upon racialization in many different international contexts. Um, and in hearing your presentations, I was thinking about too, of moving towards like interventions to help to start eradicate the system of racialization and getting towards those interventions. We're definitely gonna have to partner with government entities um, and stakeholders who can help our strategies reach the population that they're most at need. So given the context that you're all doing your research in, I would love to hear your thoughts and advice on almost in a way kind of the packaging or how to approach stakeholders to partner with them to help to find solutions to resolve the system of racialization. And I realize in many of the nations and the countries that you're doing your research in, if they're not even gonna acknowledge race at the, <laughs> the forefront, then it might be hard to approach those, pro those stakeholders and come with them like, hey, I wanna eradicate racism. So I was curious about your thoughts on how you um, approach different stakeholders and what your recommendations are for future research, both in um, doing that um, collective community partner work, but also too in seeking funding, you know, so that we can take this work to scale. And at some point we're gonna require state entities or government intervention to help get this work out there. So sorry for the long question, but I'm really excited to hear your thoughts and opinions. Yeah, thank you so much for the for the comment and question. Um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely correct that like, you know, the sort of disavow of race as a category makes this kind of work very difficult, if not impossible. So in the context of France, um, what thing, one thing that, a couple of things that have been, that have been tried and, you know, successfully tried. Um, one of which is, um, so I'll give a scholarly example and then maybe a more kind of activist example. Um, 
So there was a, um, a survey of second generation immigrants throughout France, which I cite a lot in my work. And they, among other things, the, the demographers were trying to, to who, stud, who, who uh, designed the survey, uh, the trajectories and origins uh, study of Ined, um, you know, were trying to get at experiences of discrimination and racism um, among, you know, minoritized individuals in France. And they experienced a lot of resistance to even the sort of questions that they asked. And they had to be very, very strategic in how they framed questions so that they were ostensibly asking about anything that could be coded as race and racism. And so, you know, the study, I mean, it was done and it's, it's, it's a really great resource for scholars like me who don't do quantitative work. But I think it speaks to, among other things, um, how much energy is required to even begin to have these conversations at a, even at a scholarly level. Um, so, so that's the scholarly example. And then the activist example, sort of in what I'm doing in my current uh, book that I, I started to talk about in my remarks, is that a lot of anti-racist activists in France have to rely on resources from outside of France, so that you see the influence of, you know, open society and other foundations who are able to sort of try to do studies or do research or collect data on the number of, for example, police stops of Black and Maghreban ordered individuals. Like that work funded by a French entity is pretty much impossible, so they've had to require on non-French actors or stakeholders to do that work. And so I think part of the issue then is, um, and, and you know, Particularly, think about the European context is the need to sort of ally with non-European entities in order to even have the sort of material resources to do this kind of work. So the situation at you know the context that present is pretty bleak, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that's a really good question, and um, one of the things that there I have a few different answers, but one thing to remember is that, well, for me, the way that I'm looking at it is that a lot of it is from the state itself. So getting the state to help <laughs> eradicate what they're doing yeah. is, is not where I would go in the first place, right? So in the context of the United States, for example, I think the most hope is when, if people can recognize how the global war on terror has, and I, I meant to get to the, say this in the presentation, while Muslim is used, to expand on these laws and policies in the United States, the impact has actually been greater on undocumented people in this country who aren't Muslim or um, actually broken windows policing, um, the war on drugs. This is where the impact has its greatest um, you know, impact it because Muslims are like one to 2% of the population. They are experiencing it, but it's actually like, I just wrote an op-ed I'm trying to get placed on fusion centers. Fusion centers are a 9-11 policy where you have um, local police collaborating with state police and federal police. So they're sharing information, right? And they're sharing information to thwart another terrorist attack. Well, they're not finding terrorism as an issue in like Boston and New Jersey and, and whatnot. So what they're doing with these fusion centers are they're, um, they're, do, they're participating in broken windows policing. They're actually talking about abortion activists now. And it's all done under secrecy because anything under counterterrorism policies, they don't have to talk about or tell you about, right? Or reveal. So the reason I put the Muslim Justice League up there, Boston, I work with them. They're the ones trying to collaborate with you know, people who are doing stuff to get the police held accountable for the stuff that they're doing with racial profiling in Boston. So it's, and they're working on fusion centers, Brick is Boston. So that's very ground up in terms of, you know, dismantling a policy that's a counterterrorism policy in the United States that relies on racialization of Muslims that has a much larger impact in the United States. In, in China, um, Uyghur Muslims, we see in the United States, Weirdly, um, we're, we're seeing a lot of attention being placed and um, highlighting the abuses of Uyghur Muslims. And you have to think about that. Why is the United States interested in helping Uyghur Muslims and abuses against Muslims there when I know how much they participated in globally and here? So those are you know, different relation, geopolitical relationships that we need to uncover, but it is happening in the United States where we see Uyghur voices being uplifted. So I think it's a very good question, a very complicated answer though, in terms of what would it really take to get these things dismantled, yeah. So my last question, I, I, this is a very how to eradicate racism that is a very important question and I keep 
asking myself how to do that. And so both panelists uh, talk about their own perspective. And I'm, I'm still thinking and I'll probably keep thinking for my entire life, especially as long as uh, I live in the United States, because race is such a serious, so serious uh, aspect of the of this society. But I want to uh, give you the two, a little bit different angle to that question, so that you can think about the question deeper. So one of the things is, it's not racism; it's racism multiple forms of racism. Racism is not just one form. And that there's a, a lot, of, when I live in the United States, a lot of people talk about white supremacy, but then white supremacy, not it's not a universal form of racism. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, racism. That's something we, when we talk about how to eradicate racism, we have to talk about how to eradicate racism, multiple forms of race, racism. And that's one thing I would like to mention. And the second thing is that it's all racism is bad. Racialization is bad. I, I don't use the term racism. I consider racism is negative, bad, and had a multiple uh, negative implication um, for many, to many groups. But then when it comes to racialization, there's a racialization as a self-defense and that applied to, uh, the, for instance, some, some history, uh, the, uh, one part of the history in Japan, it's a self-racialization. And it's very important to make uh, in-group racialization what can be called, might be called self-racialization and a defensive act to protect oneself. And then uh, out-group racialization, uh, racialization, what we usually call racialization. And then there's a tons of studies of out-group racialization, but there aren't so many self-racialization or in-group racialization. Like how, why Japanese people started racializing themselves in the post World War II. And at certain point in, in the construction of the uh, Japanese empire, it's part of the defensive mechanism uh, to fight against the tide of uh, Western imperialism. And uh, so in a way, uh, I think that's, how to eradicate racism and how to eradicate racialization uh, are two different questions to me. And then we need more study about self racialization, in group racialization studies. Can I have one more thing? Mm -hmm. I, I think it was really interesting. But I also just want to add like, you have to, everybody has to find like why it matters to them. You get to, you have to get the stakeholders. And, and, you know, and I think that's something that scholarship can do, the studies can do. Um, so I just feel like sometimes we're like, well, that's their problem, it's not my problem. We have to make people see how these problems all intersect on some level. Okay, so this question is from the WebCat. Um, so they asked, what are the strengths and weaknesses of using categories in admin data to capture racialization and they're thinking about how you could see Muslim racialized in the former Yugoslavia because it was an ethnicity in their senses. So yeah, this is now thinking about strengths and weaknesses of using categories and perhaps and it leads into this next question too about is the quantitative approach is this is there value in that? Um, or is it really too complex? I can start with yeah, no. I feel like I, I don't, I, you're always smart. <laughs> I'll be on the spot for this one. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, I think this question of categories, um, it's useful to think about not just how people themselves are subsumed within categories, but how they interact vis-a-vis -vis categories, which again, like is another plug for, you know, ethnographic and other qualitative measures to really get at the sort of, you know, how racialization operates, how it's actually experienced by people who are harmed by the racialization. Um, you know, it's one of the things to go back to a specific example in France that comes up, you know, at least as long as I've been doing this work and probably longer, is this deb ongoing debate around ethnic statistics and sort of thinking about, you know, should France really make a move towards collecting this kind of data and what are the pros and cons of doing so? And so there's a sort of, um, there's a, again, longstanding debate uh, among social scientists, demographers within France around sort of, you know, um, well, one against it because of the sort of Republican ethos of race not actually mean anything, but, you know, for it because it would help us better capture some of these dimensions that we're trying to study. But the flip side of that, um, or the flip argument of that is that, you know, there's a way in which, and I think this is true, not just in France, but uh, continental Europe more generally, there's a way in which the categories themselves are seen to further separate uh, plural society, to further separate particular societies. So there's always a sort of critique, which I, I understand sort of from years of doing this work of, you know, the fact that the United States or, you know, even the UK have these ethnic statistics means that, you know, in the US example, we're much more of a sort of separated or divided society. So there's very much a concern that, you know, if we were to collect this data or have this data at the administrative level, what does that mean for sort of, you know, societal cohesion, which for various reasons, France has been obsessed with for, you know, thousands of years, right? And so I think it's really helpful to think about not just in terms of, I think there's a sort of academic version of this conversation, but there also is a sort of how non-academics, otherwise known as normal people, experience these phenomena. So I kind of want to like point to that distinction as well. I mean, I think it is, I think it, I think it is complicated and it, it's not, it, 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 it needs to be complicated. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. It just means that you need to do it in a more nuanced and complicated way where in some places, yes, ethnicity matters in other places, religion is what's gonna matter. And so the measure has to, uh, has to account for all of these differences, which is what I really like Maggie is like your interest in qualitative work to help guide some of this because it's true that qualitative work is where we're not stuck to a few questions that just ask, you know, these questions that I also work with survey data. The survey data gives me very sometimes important and larger numbers, but not the nuance of what's actually the important identity in that matter. So I think like in terms of, yeah, I mean, in Muslim racialization in India, which I didn't talk about today, it's communalism that's being pushed, but um, communalism you know, in this notion of being a one nation that you're talking about, Gene, is the same in China. That's what's being perpetuated. And in, in, in anyone who wants to deter or deviate through their cultural attributes or beliefs from the nation is then actually racialized, you know? And so I think that um, you have to account for, that's why on a global scale, it's a very large and a very large project. And I'm sure I'll get the critique of this is too large. Why are you even <laughs> saying global racialization? Because it doesn't operate like this here. It may not, but um, it is offered. The racialization of Muslims is operating on a global scale because of the counterterrorism policies that were put into place. So I think that it just requires not a simplistic um, set of questions, if that makes sense, that answers. So in some places, yes, you got to ask about ethnicity. Some places you have to ask about religion and, or, you know, that was can I, can I add to my previous answer? Sorry, just, just to interrupt quickly. Um, and I meant to say this earlier. I think one way to think about this also that I find really useful is to also consider the fact that, you know, in the United States, we do have these ethnic statistics, but many people don't engage with them the way that they're supposed to in quotation marks, right? So, you know, the people who are categorized as Asian American, who don't see that identity the same way. And so I think even sometimes when we think about, you know, whether or not to have ethnic statistics or not, we miss the nuance and how people in societies with those, with those data actually interact with the categories. And I think we need to pay more attention to that. And also I just wanna echo what uh, Professor Slaw just said, because I think when we think globally, 
Um, it, it's not just a question around sort of what the state is doing. It's also a question of how uh, racialized populations themselves are making connections across state boundaries and thinking globally. And, you know, again, in the context of France, how people think about, you know, their blackness uh, is often in reference with black populations outside of France. And so, again, I think the global dimension is not just one that's sort of top down, if you will, but also one that's bottom up, as crude as that distinction is. Okay, so this next question is from one of the Racism Lab students. It says, Dr. Suzuki describes the importance of continuing Dr. Du Bois' work on exposing the racist roots of epistemic scientific colonialism. Specifically, you share that Dr. Du Bois' critique of the white scientific method in which white scholars adopt a car window sociology approach to describe black people as inferior. What are ways that you interrogate this in your own work and are there specific recommendations you have for assessing the prevalence of the white scientific method in one's own work? So it's a very complicated, complicated question. Can you make it short or rephrase it? So in your like reading about um, the car window sociology, I guess they're pretty much asking what are ways that you could like, or what are recommendations you could critique using like the white scientific method in your own work? Did that get a little bit closer? I think this could also be a broader question for all of the scholars. Um, this is about, I think this is about, um, you know, the kinds of questions that we ask and then the way we answer them. And I think the students probably um, might have been um, referring to your work that not everything is about white supremacy in other cultures. This is about colonialism, imperialism. Um, but, um, but I think the question then perhaps to all of you is about um, how we might combat um, whiteness in our own scientific methods and the questions that we ask and the ways that we go about our research. It's so ingrained in the way we're trained, um, but how might we go about it? Based on ethnic studies in particular, uh, a lot of theories and the concepts are developed in the United States experiences of the United States. So in order to engage you know, the mainstream, quote unquote, mainstream ideas, uh, non-American scholars or the people who studied about outside the United States have to use uh, those kind of lexicon or the concept. So uh, always, you know, what we have to always do is like engaging work, which is, uh, how can I say, uh, I think to, in a simpler term, uh, a scholar like us has to uh, doing and keep doing two tasks at the same time. One is, uh, deconstruction work, uh, which is what is the problematic of centering white or the put the white in the top of the racial hierarchy, because the reality reflects various kind of racism. And uh, another thing is that we have to do is the construction of the other or the discourse or the the concept or the language that is necessary, uh, uh, which is which reflect the peculiarity or the different kind of uh, experiences in other part of the world, racial experiences or ethnic experience, whatever you might want to call it, uh, and those things has to go together. You can't just do one thing. Uh, deconstruction is not good enough. We have to construct a more uh, autonomous uh, discourse and then put together both on the same table, start discussing. And that's very important 
but it is very difficult. And that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> I hope this is an answer to the question. I have one other view. Um, there, there are lots of gatekeepers in our, <laughs> there are lots, and they are journal editorial boards. Um, so, you know, sir, we need to diversify a lot of spaces for the epistemological changes to happen. So, you know, that, that's another thing. Like site, like what Melissa said, were you citing? Um, and then also, you know, serve on boards and, and, and review articles and don't reject them if they're not citing, you know, yeah. the same, white scholars who are reproducing this kind of, you know, white centric race scholarship, you know, and that's, that's a bigger structural issue in the academy, but I do think that's a part of it as well. Yeah, yeah, just unless there's a question in the, yeah, after? No, okay. okay. Thank you for taking the time to speak now for like two or three hours. I know you must be drinking early. Um, but I was trying to get my thoughts on paper a little bit. Um, so we see this is more about racism and not so much racialization. So bear with me, please. Um, so we see how racism has contributed to the practice of othering those who don't fit into this binary of black and white in the US context, at least, where race is a prominent factor in categorizing people. When we're talking about social justice as a movement and building allyship, specifically when we're talking about Muslim women who have built these allies who have then turned into this new wave feminist idea of like saving Muslim women from this oppressive religion or um, in France where race in general is not acknowledged and blackness specifically is not acknowledged or in Japan where lineage and blood supersedes assimilation or years spent in Japan. Um, we then have this idea where communities create these enclaves and become insular as a way of protecting themselves from racism. So can you talk about the nuances of those communities protecting themselves and creating these enclaves as a way to protect themselves from this external racism um, that they face? Thank you. I'm looking at you. Yeah, like I, I got this Um Yeah, thanks for that question. Just answering kind of off the cuff, I would say a couple of thoughts about the French context specifically. So, you know, um, oftentimes uh, one sort of charge that, that is levied at North African and Black uh, populations in France is this charge of communitarianism or this charge of separatism, that they're not sort of fully integrating themselves into French society, that sort of um, having these sort of insular communities. And I think it's really crucial to unpack that because it's really not the case. What's the case is the sort of state structure, state racism is sort of, you know, um, putting them all together, if you will. And so even if it's as individual, so in, less in my current work, but in my first book, for example, I talk a lot about how uh, individuals feel like they are French and they're individuals in French society, but they're sort of subsumed in this, often this Muslim other category, right? And so it's not about them separating themselves or seeking to separate themselves. It's rather the sort of ways in which the state is continually reminding them that they are just part of this like mass of this non-white mass, if you will, right? And so I think we have to be kind of attentive to those distinctions. And for example, there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of issues in France in, in the last 10 years or so around um, gatherings that are seen as not diverse. But, you know, some of the, the sort of critiques pushing pushing back on that, it's like, well, you know, the National Assembly is also not diverse, it's primarily white, but it's not constructed as a, you know, separatist community, right? And so I think, I think sometimes it's this, these language, these terms that we use, we have to kind of unpack kind of who's making these accusations and what kind of discursive role that they're actually serving. So that's kind of an initial response as it relates to the French context. I mean, I think that the, I mean, what you're asking about is like, you know, what I'm seeing in my new research on Muslims is that there's actually, I'm shocked at this because, you know, when Trump was running, they were talking about Muslim neighborhoods. And besides Dearborn, I wasn't aware of Muslim neighborhoods, but 
I'm actually hearing about Muslim neighborhoods, shockingly, in Dallas, you know? So communities kind of, um, for, for, Air, for South Asian, for South Asian, um, there are these mosques being built and Muslim communities wanting to live close to that area or students who go to college and then they start to, you know, in high school, they didn't have any Muslim friends and then in college it becomes, you know, a space for them to protect themselves from all the, the aggressions that they've experienced because they were the only one or whatnot. So I think, I mean, and then we can look at, you know, um, you know, black in the United States, racial residential segregation, but then also like how protection, you know, is provided when you're um, surrounded by people who aren't harassing you or policing you, or, although a lot of neighborhoods are policed, you know. So I think there's something about that, how racism, you know, sort of um, contributes to people coming together to protect themselves or find spaces. You know, you could talk about Du Bois in this way in the veil or, you know, thinking about Beverly Tatum's work on, you know, why at a PWI, why do you see communities of color coming together because that's the only way they can survive those forces really. So I think that's a really interesting question about how racism can create these spaces that aren't natural like Benita Silva talks about naturalization of race. Like it's just that people wanna hang out with each other. No, people wanna, protect themselves from what they experience in these deeply racialized societies. So I appreciate that question because it's really thought provoking. Yeah, okay, we have time for one more question. I definitely, yeah, thank you. So yeah. I want to disclose that yeah. I'm not a sociologist, I'm an epidemiologist. So my question comes from probably my epidemiology background. Um, I would like to know what are your thoughts on what is the interplay between the racialization process and our economic system? I'm basically bringing up this question, like I'm Colombia, and okay, my country also went through the colonization process, and we can see that we also did social hierarchies based on our the tone, the tone of our skins. So, but that also uh, have been in interplay with the, our economic system, right? Which is kind of similar economic system that the one is here in place in the United States. So, but I tend to see that when we talk about racialization, we read how, they, how does it serve to our capitalist society? And mm -hmm. I would like to know your thoughts about it and how these two things interplay in our society. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks for the question. Um, so, I mean, I think this is, you know, and uh, one of the ways that I think racial framework of racial capitalism is, is so useful here. Um, and, you know, you can think about this in the context of the United States, but again, going back to France, I think this is what is so interesting, one of the things that's so interesting to studying racism um, as it relates to the economic system in France, because again, like the narrative is that slavery didn't happen within France, whereas like, you know, which is, you know, A, false, but B, um, allows for uh, kind of a suppression of the fact that the labor of, you know, black and brown populations led to the sort of creation of France as we understand it now in terms of its empire, its wealth, et cetera. And so I think there's a, there's a purposeful um, delineation between the two, which serves to, well, one, you know, for France to not have to pay reparations to anyone, um, and also just for it to sort of completely suppress and, and uh, disavow its own colonial history. And so what, if what's, it acknowledges colonial history, it has to bring in the question of economics, and of course it doesn't want to do that. So I think we have to be attentive to the ways that not only that um, those are those are actively kept separate when they're very integral. So I appreciate you bringing that to the discussion. I think racialization and the economic system, these two things are very, very, uh, okay. Closely together. And uh, one example that um, I put based on my research about Koreans in comparative study, Korean in Japan and the US. Uh, US Koreans, that's the, my interviewees, some of my interviewees, and the US Korean female uh, interviewees said very interesting that uh, uh, they say, well, this is like a uh, eating class situation, which is like a fraternity sorority 
uh, at this particular university. And then there was a very like, uh, quote unquote, prestigious eating class, only like uh, smart people and then good looking and uh, uh, children of successful, uh, successful uh, like prestigious organization. Uh, can get in. And then in this particular uh, university, then in this eating club, uh, that means no, if you are white, you are not eligible to apply for that eating club. And the uh, interesting thing is Korean uh, made after the, the massive immigration to the United States, especially 1.5 generation, and then the second generation Koreans, they achieved significant uh, the social economic upward mobility in the United States. So the uh, at that time when I was conducting research, uh, we did I, I didn't we didn't have second generation here in the United States yet. But then interesting thing is that uh, the these uh, Koreans female student there applied for that particular uh, eating class. And then they are, when they are rejected, they complain. And a complaint, this complaint is interesting. They didn't complain about the races. Uh, instead, they said, we are white because of our economic status. Our family members or the father and parents, uh, the mother, they achieved such a significant advancement and then that the economic mobility or occupational mobility upward. So we should be considered as part of white. So they asserted the white uh, racial status. And so the, in other words, they try to redefine what it means, uh, what whiteness means in the US context. I'm not sure whether they are successful or not in this attempt, and, uh, but I think that's, that's one example that these two things, like a capitalist system or economic system is really uh, you know, linked, closely tied together uh, with the racialization or the race system. The racialization is motivated by economic Mean for economic gain. So, um, whether it's racial capitalism in the United States or the European context, but in um, in China, those camps are essentially labor camps as well, right? So, I think we always have to be thinking about the economic underpinnings. There's the surveillance in industrial complex, and in I mean, there's so many layers of the economic motivations behind the global war on terror. So you're absolutely right to say like, what are the links here? Because it's what drives it in a lot of, for a lot of, you know, what I study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And with that, that was a really great question to end up on. So um, I'd like to thank our panelists and thank everybody online and thank everybody who stayed in the room. Um, and so I'm really excited uh, to continue to digest everything that we've been learning today. And um, I look forward to seeing everybody then next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.